Boy, Miles Michaelis has got all four hitters to two strikes and been unable to put any of them away. That's Otani and Freeman, four for four, four knocked in, five runs scored. How'd you like to face this group? Fly ball left center field, routine for Chris Taylor. And on a perfect day in Los Angeles, the Dodgers take Otani's home debut seven to one over the St. Louis Cardinals. It's what it sounded like yesterday on the Dodgers broadcast. We didn't want to be hearing them today here on BK and Ferrario. Unfortunately, when you lose, the highlights are on the other side, and that's what it sounded like yesterday as the Cardinals. You knew it right away. You knew it right a bleeping away. It wasn't going to go your way. Feels Miles familiar. Michaelis doesn't look good. He ends up getting hit around the top three in that Dodgers lineup. My God, good luck to everybody that's going to be facing them this season. The first time we've seen three MVPs at the top three of an offense ever in the history of this great sport that we all love. So uh, that not exactly the easiest team to go up against in your season debut. And that's where we begin today with the Cardinals losing seven to one on opening day in a game that looks a lot like the games that we saw last year, guys. The Cardinals formula was supposed to be have starters that give you a chance, have an offense that ends up adding on runs late, and they did none of the above. You get three hits on the day, all from Paul Goldschmidt. You had two other players that reached base, one Victor Scott with the error from Mookie Betts. I, I think it should have just been ruled uh, Victor Scott deserves this base. Let's give him a hit here, but whatever. So Victor Scott gets on base via error. You have one other walk over the course of the day, and that's it. Five base runners the entirety of the day. I understand you don't have a whole lot of opportunities to get on against Tyler Glass now, but they go with, go with Yarbrough, who throws 89 miles an hour, and you couldn't get anything in three innings against him offensively? That was, that was flashbacks to Zach Duke as a pirate right there. That is inexcusable. This team has to be able to score runs this year. I know it's one day. Guys, I'm not going to try to overreact today. It's one game. We got 161 more of these. Yeah, but we're on pace to go 0 and 162. That's true. We will not win what a game. the worst thing that can happen to you if you're a candidate for presidential term, right? One of the worst things that can happen is you say or do something that confirms all of the greatest fears about what your candidacy would be. In baseball, the worst thing that can happen to you as a team is to have so many question marks going into the season. People doubting one specific aspect of your team. And then on opening day, every single one of those concerns is confirmed based upon the way that you performed and that's what happened yesterday there was nothing unlucky about that there was no batted ball luck that went against them no it was a pitcher that plays to contact that got hit around pretty hard including a couple of home runs and you find a way to lose seven to one on opening day alex what was your biggest takeaway from that? i mean it wasn't even the full game that confirmed my fears about this team it was the first inning and if you want to broaden it it was the first three innings i mean that first inning for miles michaelis and look i get it one two three punch is going to be the best in baseball no if ands ors about it like shohei otani mookie betts freddie freeman but, I mean, Miles Michaels, what was he at after the first inning? 23, 24 pitches? I think he was almost at 30. Yeah, yeah. And, and you were already giving up the two runs. It felt, and honestly, that would have been a lot uglier if not for Shohei Otani uh, thinking Mookie Betts was going to round third. Uh, tinfoil Ferrario here. Betts, uh, I'm sorry, Shohei bet on himself to have a triple in his That's first at-bat. And screwed himself there. But regardless. pitches, by the way, after the first yeah, inning. Yeah, I mean, that confirmed my biggest fear about this team in the first inning. Guys, Miles Michaelis is supposed to be your second best pitcher. And again, I understand it's the Dodgers. I won't overreact because it is one bleeping game against what will be the best team in baseball with that one, two, three punch. But uh, I mean, like, there's just, there's no finishing about it with Miles Michaelis. Like, one, we, we heard it there. Uh, all of those runs came on, on two strikes against the Dodgers. There's just no finishing push there with Miles Michaelis. It seems like everybody's got the jump on him, and he's a pitch to contact pitcher. And I'm sorry, but pitch to contact is not going to work against other teams like this with your team. Yeah, that's where I was. Was It was another reminder that pitch to contact is a tough way to live in the modern game. Like, it really is. I mean, you mentioned it four straight batters with two strikes. Well, you know what that reminds me of last year? It reminds me of their two-strike problems a year ago, and they thought maybe that was pitch sequencing. You know, maybe it was Contreras not calling the right pitches. Well, when Michaelis is on the mound, he's just a pitch-to-contact guy. It's a lot harder for him to put guys away. I was stunned he had five strikeouts in the me game. Me too. Um, and 
though, yes, that I that was kind of what I feared for the Cardinals pitching. What I fear more is I still think this offense is going to be very good. They got shut down by a legitimate ace that when an ace has his A game, as you're going to see a lot in baseball this year, they will shut down any offense. What concerns me more, though, is that this starting pitching, sure, they want them to eat innings, is that you're done by the third inning. I mean, when you're down 5 nothing after three, guys, that is a tough mountain And that's to supposed to be your second best pitcher. Now we've got to go through the next three that we're very concerned about with this team. And this gets to something that I looked up earlier today. T-Bone, we were talking about how pitching can be the thing that puts you over the top. Even when last night you see a... That's the A stuff from Tyler Glass now. But in his first game, he didn't have his A stuff. And he still went five innings for the Dodgers. Gave up, I think it was one earned run against the San Diego Padres. A solid lineup. They've got kind of similar to the Dodgers, a really good top half of the order. And then just kind of guys filling out the bottom half. Um, but Glass now was really good in that one as well. When you look at just the overall end results, gave his team a chance to win. That's what great pitching can do against any lineup that it sees. Offense is harder. Offense is the thing that is more erratic. We talk about it a lot with the Cardinals. They're not the only team that plays this way, right? When you go up against great pitching, most lineups get shut down. It's why when we get to the postseason, the games are lower scoring than they are in the regular season because all you're seeing is the best starters, the best relievers that a team has to offer. So, Miles Michaelis last season, when he went up against playoff teams, which is what he saw yesterday, that's a playoff team wherever you think they end up. 13 starts against playoff teams, went about 80 innings essentially, averaged six innings per start, had a 5.5 ERA against them with a 1.4 whip. For context, to give you like an example of what does that mean? What does a 5.5 ERA and a 1.4 whip mean? That is Patrick Corbin from last year. Patrick Ooh. Corbin on the season had a 5.2 ERA with a 1.4 whip. So Michaelis was slightly worse against playoff teams last year than Patrick Corbin was on the season in its entirety. The reason why I think that it's okay to have a little bit of, or ha was okay at least, to have a little bit of confidence heading into this season for Michaelis is what he did in 2021. Miles Michaelis in 2021 had eight starts against playoff teams. In those eight starts, he averaged more than six innings, had a 2.2 ERA, and a 1.0 whip. For context on what that means, last season, Blake Snell had an ERA of 2.2, which is what Miles Michaelis did last year or two years ago against playoff teams, and Garrett Cole was the closest comparison for that whip of 1.0. So you had a guy two years ago that performed like some combination of Blake Snell and Garrett Cole, and a guy last year against playoff teams that performed like Patrick Corbin against playoff teams. So who were you getting this year? Well, there's one thing that changed. I think if there's any pitcher in Major League Baseball that benefited the most from the shift, it was Miles Michaelis. And yesterday you see what it means, again, for that kind of a pitcher to not have the shift behind him. I think we underestimated the value of that shift behind a guy like Miles Michaelis. I think the Cardinals underestimated that value. And the other thing, and I wanted to get to this from the text line, Guys, I got to ask you the question. Why was the infield in with a man on third and one out in a 0-0 score in the first inning with Miles Michaelis pitching batting practice yeah. to Freddie Freeman? I did not like that decision. I hated it. I absolutely hated that decision. You have to concede that run, man. It's Mookie Betts on third base. You're not throwing him out. You're not going to get that out at home. Just understand that going in. Jason Wynn could have made that throw. You've got Freddie Freeman at the plate. The odds of you being able to get that out are slim to none. What you got to do is put value on getting the other out, which you would have done if the infield was playing at regular depth in that inning. If you had got the, the infield further back, you would have been able to throw out Freddie Freeman at first base. Instead, you're playing them in. Freeman safe on first. Mookie Betts is able to score the run, and you get none of the above. I, I think Ollie's a really good manager. I, I really do. One of the things that I do not understand that he continues to do regularly is put so much emphasis on bringing the infield in to be able to try to get that run at home. I understand that the run is valuable. I get that. But it's the first inning of a game against the Dodgers, and you've got Freddie Freeman at the plate. Do you really think he's just going to hit some, like, soft roller to third base? Is that your belief? It's Freddie Freeman, man. So, uh, anyways, I, I was frustrated by that yesterday for sure. I, I think that decision by Ollie told you everything that he thought about in that game. That they were them, them scoring runs was going to be at a premium against Tyler Glass now. And the better their run prevention could be for Miles Michaels, the better chance they had. And it didn't work out. And look, that 
Ground ball by Freeman wouldn't hit hard up the middle. It ends up being a base hit because the infield is Correct. in, though. So I, I understood what he was trying to do. I probably would have just played the infield back. I mean, it it's is game inning, one, dude. and it's game one of the season. It's not like we're in the playoff push that you're trying to prevent that kind of a run. But, yeah, I think that was a sign of, like, okay, Ollie knows that that team was in a bad spot in game one. Well, what does that mean for games two through 162 the I, rest of the season? I mean, I know I'm in the minority in this because everybody, what BK said, like you're going up against Tyler Glass now, I, you're expected to struggle against that. I, I expected more competitive offense than this from this team. If we're going to act like this offense is going to be great this season, I expected something more than one guy picking up hits. And I get it was Tyler Glass now. Corbin Burns just did that against the Angels. But essentially, you were the Angels offensively yesterday. And to me, that's a problem when we're talking about this offense supposed to be so great i get it's tyler glass now i get that he's awesome but you can't give me any competitive at bats from somebody other than paul goldschmidt and if game one my manager is concerned about a runner at third base which is the first run of the game man i'm a little more concerned about this offense than what i should have been yeah i, I thought it was a bad look for the offense yesterday at least paul goldschmidt showed up that was awesome that that's one of the biggest concerns that we had in spring training i'm somebody that tells you all the time t-bone hey spring training stats don't matter i think two two different sides of this uh, that was true for miles michaelis was really good in spring it didn't go well for him yesterday paul goldschmidt was genuinely horrific in spring it went really well for him yesterday so the spring training stats did not matter on either side with that you need paul goldschmidt to return to form this year he looked great yesterday at the plate. Sign him to like, an extension. Looked like the timing well, was no. there. He, it, I saw somebody on Twitter said that if you look at his bat speed from yesterday, it was three of like his best bat swing speeds from a year ago would have been in yesterday's game. So it, he, he looks the part. Now it's about sustaining that and doing it over 162. We get all of that. But Goldie being back to form, it's why he was one of the top three players in our 20 most important players list. That was a an encouraging sign for him. Yesterday was a tough task. You're going up against one of the best pitchers in baseball when he's healthy. You're going up against a lineup that has a chance to be one of the best that we've ever seen in the history of the sport with Betts, Otani, and Freeman. It's a tall task, and we all understood that going in. The next few games are a little different, in my opinion. You're going up against what is still a great offense in the Dodgers, but the pitching is different. Gavin Stone, Bobby Miller, those are two young starters that you should at least have an opportunity to hit a little bit. Yamamoto, we, we have no idea if he's going to be good in Major League Baseball or not at this point in the season. Your offense needs to get things going. That's, that's what is at stake over the next few games. Again, the sky is not falling. You should feel today the same way that you felt yesterday. The problem is a lot of people felt yesterday that the, the pitching was going to be yeah. a problem. I actually do feel what I felt and, like and yesterday. And what you saw yesterday was no sign that that was going to be any different in 2024. I like so. being right, so I feel better after yesterday. I felt vindicated, you know, just yeah. like the top line for the Blues. I felt vindicated when Michaelis gave up those five runs. 314-399-9646 nice. is the Air Comfort Service text line to get involved in the show. We'll certainly be hearing from you guys throughout the day today. We'll get to ask us anything at 1145. At 1130, we got to talk about T-Bones, Illini, and a yes. football matchup in the Elite Eight of the NCAA tournament. Clemson versus Alabama. How do we get here? What's the theme of the tournament thus far? Saban's going to win. One thing in particular. He retired, man. What? One thing in particular that we can take away as a theme from this year's tournament for the teams that remain. We'll get into all of that coming up later on today. But yesterday, the Blues, another nice victory for St. Louis. You get a yeah. couple of assists from your goalie. That what? typically ends well for you. What? <laughs> This stretch run, though, is a reminder that they still need to overhaul the defensive core. We'll tell you oh. why next year on 101 ESPN. <laughs>
it out of the park this baseball season at DraftKings at Casino Queen. Book DraftKings at Casino Queen's Stay and Play Cardinals Hotel Package. This Grand Slam bundle includes one-night hotel stay, 10% off casino dining, two St. Louis Cardinals tickets, and free shuttle service to the game starting at just $149. Call 618-874-5000 to book today. Must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Based on the... Blues Talk, more often. 101 ESPN is live from the Centene Community Ice Center. Brought to you by Bud Light and E&B Granite. Bernie Federko's only choice for granite countertops, cabinets, and flooring. Blues through center. Torupchenko brings it in. It's the trailer score! Back to Krug, left side, which Navich scores! Grabs a piano off his back and he threw it into the crowd. Who's into Saad? He scores! Kairou fights Saad! Saad buries it! Three seconds to go and that'll do it. Bring out the Zamboni. The Blues sweep the flames this season. They get two big points on a scrambly game here tonight at Enterprise Center. A 5-3 win. Alongside Alex Ferrario and Tanner Hendrickson, I'm Brandon Kiley. That's what it sounded like right here at your home of the Blues 101 ESPN last night as the Blues get a much-needed victory 5-3 against the Calgary Flames. Not a game that was overly exciting in the first period, but yet a frenetic third period. Ended up being a lot of fun to watch, Alex. They find a way to come away with the victory. I, let's talk about the positives first. You needed to win that game. To yeah. give yourself any chance of being able to make the postseason, basically every game from here on out is a must win. If you look at the way that things are set up, the Blues have nine games remaining. You're at 82 points currently. So to give you an idea of what that means, L.A. is now technically the team that you are chasing. They have 87 points with 10 games remaining. Vegas has 88 points, but they have, like you, nine games remaining. So what would that mean? If these teams were to go like 500, L.A. and Vegas down the stretch, L.A. would finish with 97 points. Vegas would finish with 98 points. So you're trying to get to that like 98-ish point threshold. To do so, you would have to go 8-1 and one in your final nine games of the season. In other words, man, win out. Yeah. Win out and give yourself a chance. We'll see what happens from there. It's going to be a tough road no matter what. But your only real chance to be able to make the postseason at this point, 8-1 and one down the stretch, 
it, it ain't going to be easy, but Alex, what did you see from them last night that if you were an optimist today would give you hope that that can happen? Yeah, and I mean, I even would go even further with that, and 8-1 and say 8-0-1. Oh, like, I don't know if you can lose a game in regulation. You have to earn points in every single game, which is tough to say because you got four matchups with Edmonton, Nashville, Carolina, and Dallas in between all of these easier games. Would you say that two points in a swing, like maybe if you had one in regulation To where you Vegas, shouldn't have won. That would have helped you a little bit, maybe? Probably. Like, but if it was that head-to-head -head game against Vegas where maybe you finished the third period with your goalie pulled for a example and you have the extra attacker and scored in probably when that one and they don't get the extra point and you do but see you're saying that would have helped but see none of those games would have mattered if say you pull the goaltender to try and get that extra point and, and Vegas score. buries it and you don't get any well, points still in that be game alive. no you probably wouldn't because see now you're not chasing that team that's picking How up points well, now you, now you're you'd five? have 80 and LA would have 87 and you would just have to go nine and zero oh instead of eight and one so we're still stretch. going undefeated down the stretch no matter what yeah you had to do it okay, way. so <laughs> I would stick with the undefeated rather than pull the goaltender and go undefeated Look, I mean, if you are an optimist, here's the thing. You didn't play your best game against Calgary, and you still found a way to win. That gives you the optimism because a lot of the games that you're going to be playing down the stretch are against these types of opponents. And, and we've, so, we've talked about it, the Columbuses, the Chicagos, the San Jose's. You've played those opponents, you looked bad, and you didn't win. Now at least you're finding the offense, and you know your goaltending can hold you in hockey games, and you won that game last night. Did you get the benefits from some officials? Probably, but you still won. The problem for the Blues is they've got to be near perfect, if not perfect, when they take on those four tough opponents. And that's that's where I'm so skittish right now. You've got offense. We'll talk about this a little bit later. The offense is showing its face with this team. You know you got goaltending. Last night, if you're the ultimate optimist, you feel like you could still pick up points for a lot of these games no matter what and hope that the other teams work in your favor. If you're on the pessimistic side, that's me. there's T-Bone. I think if you watched that game last night, you saw the shortcomings of this team that really have not shown themselves this season. Maybe some of it is because of your goaltending. I think some of it also is they played better, but your defense is starting to become a problem again. Yep. I mean, Cal Calgary parked themselves in front of the net. That was the toughest game that I think Bennington has had to play all season because they were all over him. You okay, dude? Are you getting emotional about this? It, it's, you know what? Miles Michaelis hurt me yesterday. I get it. And and I think it's just all built up to this point right now. There's There were a lot of deflections. There were a lot of bodies in front of the net on Jordan Bennington. And, and like, I, I look at the three goals that were scored last night. I know it's it's rough right now. I don't know why. <laughs> Justin Falk had his pocket pick. Let's just battle through this together right now, guys. <laughs> BK, be a pro and Damn focus. it, just focus, all right? Justin Falk got his pocket picked last night behind the net that led to Kuzmenko skating around him and shooting the puck in. That was a pretty goal, by the way. Yeah, it was very pretty, but he shouldn't have had it picked off. I wanted the Blues to get him. <laughs> it would have been good. Yeah, he scored. Was he seven goals in 19 games? Yeah. Yeah, that's a goal scorer right there. Justin Falk was standing in front of the net when Kuzmenko was all by himself to deflect that power play goal in. And then you are, I'm sorry, Huberdo. And then the other one was Scott Perunovic going out too far and leaving a guy alone in front of the net. You don't he should have, have been on the ice. He should have been off for a change, and he forgot to get It was a penalty kill, off. right, PK? No. no. It, he should have been <laughs> off the ice. It, what I'm saying he is... He had an opportunity. They were in the offensive zone, and he didn't get off the ice when he was supposed to be off of the ice. Wow. It was Tory Krug's turn to be on the ice. You are not it's Tory Krug's turn. Part. It's my <laughs> turn. Drew, I'm having fun, though. <laughs> the problem right now is defensively, you're falling back into what you were last year where the backdoor tap-ins. You're getting out-muscled in front of your own net, and if that's where we're at, well, welcome back to what we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Like, if you're going to make this right, you, we got to go back to fixing your defense right now because I love the way Nick Letty plays. love the way Tori Krug plays. Kessel, Pareko, it just feels like you have to fix certain areas that you're getting beat in front of your own net. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And we, we've known for a while, though, this team has to outscore its own issues and they have to have Jordan Bennington or Joel Hofer, whoever's in net. Hofer's been really good this year as well. Um, but specifically right now with Benner getting the majority of these opportunities um, in must-win situations, you need Benner to save you. That's that's just going to be the reality of what this team is, where they're at. And so far this year, he, for the most part, has. There's a, a nerdy number for the NHL called goals saved above, above expected. Essentially, it goes with uh, the old expected expected goal stats how often do you save those chances and for Jordan Bennington this has not been a kind statistic to him in the past he has not been somebody that typically rates out well in this this year it has he's uh, essentially tied for fourth in the NHL and goals saved above expected he's behind Connor Hellebuck Thatcher Demko Anthony Stollers 
The Florida Panthers guy has been really good this yeah. year. I'm not super familiar with his game. Been good, though. Um, and then it's Jordan Bennington, Bobrovsky, and Jacob Markstrom. So, uh, Benner's been really good. He has saved your ass time and time and time again. It's just really hard to win that way, man. It's yeah. really hard to consistently be able to make those saves. And thankfully for the Blues last night, the offense is able to step up. I got to give a shout-out, by the way, to Nathan Walker. I don't think the Blues yeah. win that game without his fight. They don't win that game without his fight. Steve Ott said so afterwards. I, I don't know why it took so long for this team to believe that Nathan Walker. Like, one of the things, and I understand, like, man, this team is right about things way more often than they're wrong. And they know more about hockey. They have forgotten more about hockey than we will ever know. But I am confused as to why it took so long for Jake Neighbors to get the opportunity on the top line when he has clearly shown that he is deserving of such an opportunity. And I think Jordan Cairo, by the way, has been much better on that second line given what the matchups are. We saw it again last night with the four check. Um, I, I don't understand why it took so long to make that switch with Jake Neighbors. And I don't understand why it took so long for them to commit to having Nathan Walker as a, a, a consistent member of that fourth line. He is so much better than the guys that they have been filtering through for like two and a half years. And every opportunity that he got, he clearly was the guy that deserved that opportunity. It, it is really confusing to me as to why they did not commit to him. He has everything you want. He does have a, a little bit of offense. Yeah. He's got the speed. I understand that he's tiny, like he's t he's T-bone size, but tinier. he has some tenacity to him, dude, True. clearly. And he is completely unafraid of being able to stick up for his teammates. Uh, I, I, and if you need some spark, man, he'll go out there and do that for I you. I ask this in all honesty to you guys. How many guys on this team will drop the gloves when he knows the team needs momentum? Shin. Shannon Shin's Walker. willing. Walker's and willing. Shen, Neighbors, and Walker. I think Neighbors That's is it. willing. And, and That's pretty good, though. In the past, I've only been able to say it one. It is. But if you go around and look at other teams, I, I think you could count about six or seven guys that players are willing to do that or step up for their teammate when they're on the ice. And, and I ask that because you got to have somebody who's willing to take a blow for the team. And, and Neighbors said it perfectly, and I thought it was perfect how they played that because he takes the penalty, they score eight seconds later. And, and Neighbors said after the game, like, we have to capitalize on what Walker did. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. And when I think that's part of the reason why you see guys not doing it because sometimes the team doesn't have life after somebody steps up and makes a big play like that. If you don't capitalize on your teammate doing that for you, well, then you're wasting it. And I'm with you. Nathan Walker was the reason they won that game last Can night. I read you a couple of the quotes on Nathan Walker from the players in the locker room after the game? Because I think it speaks to just what this guy means to the team. And I actually think this stuff really matters a lot as well. Like, Alex, you saying the locker room stuff matters? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's like we've talked so no. much about the leadership and what happens in the room. Man, now forget what happens in the room. What happens on the ice is what matters to me. And Walker shows it. Like he shows how much he cares about his teammates based on what he's doing on the ice. That to me is what matters. So you hear this from Brandon Sod. Quote, we're a little bit flat. He brought the passion and the energy. You could see it. Uh, you could see the whole bench lit up out there after it. So good things came after Buchnevich, Walker, every, everybody loves him. If you ask anybody on the team, he's funny, great attitude, just really happy for him. He did a great job with the fight. Small guy, but he brings the energy every single day, and I'm happy to see his success. Neighbors, he wants to scrap with the guys more than, any, more than the other way around. Guys probably underestimate him because of his size, but he's a tough little booger. He knows what he's doing, I love that. and he's good at it. You know who the cop is for Nathan Walker? And Grant and I talked about this. He's Vladimir Sabotka. That's exactly who I He's Vladimir Sabotka. What he was supposed to be. Well, yeah. first time around. But yeah, before yeah. he went to the KHL and thought he was a goal scorer. But if, for Blues fans listening, remember what Vladimir Sabotka meant to that team. He was that spark. He was a guy that would go out there and push back. He could score goals, but teams underestimated him. That's what Nathan Walker is. And you need a guy like that. They have figured out this fourth line. Zach Dean's getting an opportunity down there he right now. He looked good last well. night. It was Looks small solid. time, but I thought he made a couple of nice plays. And he was on the penalty kill late in the game when your team was up by a goal in the third period. We said it before the season. If you could have one thing this year, it wasn't necessarily making the playoffs. It was finding finding guys that are going to contribute towards success in the future. Yeah. Right now you're finding that. Torpchenko's clearly a guy like that on the fourth line. Walker, a guy like that on the fourth line. We'll see with Dean. It seems to be positive results so far, but it's super early. It's a limited sample size. Uh, Jake Neighbors, clearly top line, top six forward at a minimum moving forward. I, I think Kairou, again, over the last week or so, has really stepped his game up in a meaningful way since he's been dropped down to that second line. Robert Thomas, a legitimate number one center. I think Tory Krug's taken his game this year to a different level than what it was previously. Pareko, Letty, like... 
Jordan Bennington, I, I would be remiss not to mention him and Joel Hofer and the job they've done. Despite this being underwhelming to finish out the season probably because of what happened against Vegas and likely missing the playoffs, the season can still be considered a success given how many players have added their names to the list of your core moving yeah. forward. And Walker is just one of many that I has think, done that. I think the way this season is going to end is going to open up the eyes for Doug Armstrong in the sense of, I know where I need to fix this team. And and as I mentioned, I think right now your glaring hole is the center position that we talked about so that you can better use use your top six and know that you have those opportunities to exploit. But it, it's, fixing, it's fixing the problem on defense and finding somebody who can log a lot of minutes and clear the front of the net better than what this team can. Last year I felt like the Blues were that cartoon character where they're in the little boat and there's just there's holes that are are filling the boat with water from everywhere and so they have 27 different arms that are trying to plug all the different holes and you don't even know where to start and right now I feel like it's it's limited to where all right I kind of know where your issues are I, I I have an idea of where to start and it may not end up working you may not get the right solutions to these problems but at least I'm starting to understand okay these are where we're a little deficient. This is where we need to go in order to become a legitimate contender in the NHL. Uh, it's a much better place to be than where they were this time last year. All right, coming up in 15 minutes, we'll get to ask us anything. 314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service text line. Sports or otherwise, we'll get to your questions in 15 minutes. we got to talk about T-Bones Illini, who showed really well yesterday against the best defense in the country. We'll talk about what their path is to potentially make it to the Final Four. It ain't easy, but we'll talk about it next year on 101 ESPN.
101 ESPN Sports Center. I'm Jordan Deacon. This Sports Center update is driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. Last night, the Blues beat the Flames by a score of 5-3. to three. Like the guys just talked about, goaltender Jordan Biddington had two assists and Nathan Walker showed up big in another fight. The Blues are wrapping up this homestand against San Jose tomorrow night at 7 o'clock and we'll have the first community pregame show for you starting at 6. St. Louis City SC is also getting back into action tomorrow night. They are in Utah taking on Real Salt Lake and kickoff is set for 8.30. And all weekend long, we've got March Madness coverage for you right here on 101 ESPN beginning tonight, starting at 6, right after the fast late. I'm Jordan Deacon. The Sports Center update was driven by Johnny Londoff. Finding roads and shop 24-7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? We're back to more exclusive Blues Talk. 101 ESPN is live from the Centene Community Ice Center. Brought to you by Bud Light and E&B Granite. Bernie Federko's only choice for granite countertops, cabinets, and flooring. fight on here in the NCAA tournament. They win last night 72 to 69 against Iowa State. The number one offense versus the number one defense in college basketball. It resulted in one heck of a game. We said in the beginning of this tournament, Alex, that the East region is going to give us the best basketball games. And so far, it probably has uh, Illinois and UConn advancing to the Elite Eight from that region. They were not alone. Last night, Alabama takes down North Carolina in the West region. And Clemson with an upset as well, they take down Arizona. Arizona, I just don't understand. I, I do not understand what their game plan was. They get to the bucket time after time after time, and they're like, no, what if we settled for a bunch of threes? That's, uh, yeah, great idea, uh, Arizona. Well, and then watching Iowa State and Illinois, where they need three points to get back in the game, they're like, well, let's drive to the net. <laughs> yeah. like, why are we doing this? time for a worse shot, and maybe this is going to work for if us. If I was their but, coach and he didn't already have hair, I would have lost all of my hair. So it's the one versus the three in the East region for the Elite Eight, the four versus the six in what is a football <laughs> matchup between Alabama and Clemson. One of these things is not like the other. For the West region. T-Bone, we'll go through a few of the things that we've learned so far from this tournament, but let's start with your line because that's the local connection here. The offense has been spectacular. They miss a bunch of free throws yesterday. It doesn't end up costing them. It will if that happens again against UConn, but What's been your takeaway from your squad making it to the Elite Eight for the first time in almost 20 years? Uh, I said this going into the tournament, and it continues to rain true. They're just so balanced. that they And really the biggest thing for them here in the tournament is their defense has gotten to another level. You know, my biggest concern with them going into the tournament was, man, I don't know if they can win a game if it comes down to a defensive slugfest like last night was. Last night was a slugfest. And they were able to hold their own defensively. I thought they were great and really good defensively. They'd gotten into some foul trouble on coming off of uh, screens away from the ball. That's why Shannon had to sit on the bench because terrified the crap out of me. But uh, I, I, I'm more impressed with their defense than I am their offense coming in through the Sweet 16 going into the Elite Eight because I didn't think they could play at this level defensively. And here they are. They're playing really well. Offensively, they're still a menace, and they continue to have balanced scoring. Last night wasn't... You know, necessarily that way. I mean, Damask had just seven points, but he was a contributor. Six rebounds, five assists. Like, they did everything right. They didn't turn the basketball over. They were calm under pressure when Iowa State was bringing a lot of double teams. And then they were sound defensively enough. And though, yeah, free throws were a problem for them, they probably should have won that game by a lot if it were for their free throw struggles. 15 for 29 from the line. Just yeah. awful, awful. They, they should be better. They should be better there against UConn, but... I thought last night was a real complete game effort by the Illini. You got Shannon playing like the star that he is. You got great contributions from other ends in the court. Coleman Hawkins was awesome. Uh, defensively, you were very sound. And he's, he didn't turn the basketball He's made you over. a believer. There, he has. There was a moment last night. But you night, also hate him, well, too. There, well, there was a moment <laughs> last night where there were three occasions where he'd catch the ball, and he'd be at, like, the logo, and he's shooting a three. I'm like, what are you doing? It, it's this amazing. is what you did years prior. It's amazing to watch an Illinois basketball game while Tanner's texting you because you would think Tanner despises this team. Yeah. The all caps and exclamation points we get off of Hawkins' name is just unbeatable. So I will say this. I didn't think that this team was capable of beating a team like Iowa State in this kind of a game if Damask goes 2 for 11 from the field and finishes with 7 points and Terrence Shannon is only able to play 22 minutes in the game. I didn't think they were capable of winning that kind of a game. I, 
I thought that would be the t kind of game where you look back on it and say to yourself, just didn't have it tonight. Just didn't have it. If those two guys don't have unbelievable performances, I didn't think this team was capable of winning in the tournament. And yet they found a way. And so it speaks to the quality of the depth on this team that we haven't seen a ton of. Goody with a big-time performance last night. He didn't have a ton of points, but he had some big contributions down the stretch. Big threes down the huge, stretch. Huge, huge threes. You don't win that game without him. Um, Danger coming in and just giving you enough of a presence on the interior. That's the kind of game that I wasn't sure that they could win, and they found a way to do it. So now you take on UConn, and you can make a case this UConn team is better than the one that won the NCAA tournament last year. Like, they are an absolute buzzsaw. For yeah. a half, San Diego State played as well as you possibly can against UConn it, for a half yesterday. It felt like UConn was playing with their food against San Diego State, letting them feel close and then running away with it. It just didn't matter. UConn was so much better than them that by the end of that game, you're like, man, I don't even need to watch anymore because this is so far out of hand. San Diego State had no chance in the second half. What is your level of confidence going into this game against UConn that Illinois can pull it off and get to the final? Don't court? you lie. I, I'm not. I'm not very confident. <laughs> I, I don't think they can beat UConn, man. I, I was really hoping. You know, Motark's been always getting in and seeing what happens. My the version for Illinois was getting in and hope that UConn is a not in your region and b if they are they get knocked out of the tournament. They, they are a buzz. So I, as much as I've been impressed with the Illini. I don't think you can win a game if it has to be an offensive shootout. Like, they're going to have to find a way to get stops. And though they've been better defensively in the tournament, this is the toughest team that they have played by far. And I totally agree with you. I think they are better than the team that won the championship last year. If you told me to go on, like, a scale of, like, 1 to 10, how confident I am that the Illini beat UConn, I'm not going to lie. I'd probably be at a 2. Like, I, I just think UConn is that freaking good. Yep. And look, to be honest with you, the line I got bounced by UConn, as long as it's not, like, an absolute just killing I would be totally fine with the result because I said the ceiling for this team was Elite Eight. They get to the Elite Eight, they probably to beat one good team in the Sweet 16, mm -hmm. which they did. And if they go anywhere beyond this, I would say then that's more than what I expected. Even though I love this team and think that this team is the best one that Brennan Woods ever had, I could also look around the country and go, man, there's also some really good teams that are better than this Illini squad. I, I, I think it's easy for me to say right now the winner of that UConn-Illinois game will be in the championship game because I don't think anybody compares, Agreed. whether it's Alabama or Clemson, and I – Arizona could have beat Clemson. North Carolina could beat Alabama. None of those teams have a chance against UConn or Illinois. That is going to be the team that's fighting for the national championship. We said it at the beginning of the tournament. I, I don't remember who you had, Alex, winning it all. I have but, UConn winning it all. Yeah. But I, it's from that East Division. I think all of us had whoever we had winning the East. I don't like it. Of the course you did. Four, but uh, I had okay. Baylor, you know, stopping well, UConn have, and, well, I didn't get oh there. Boy, that I, was I had a bad bracket. Whoever I was going to take to win that region I was going to have to win the tournament and unfortunately I, I picked the team that lost in the first round with Auburn going <laughs> well, down but uh, Pearl had other obligations yeah he yeah. had to be on the he had to be on the uh, broadcast last night but I, I think we all felt that way when we saw the draw I was like okay beyond the four seed I, I don't really care about most of these teams but the top four seeds in this region were all unbelievable mm -hmm. and so the path to get there was going to be incredibly difficult and whoever did it I, I thought was going to probably win the tournament so ultimately what we have left is UConn versus Illinois I'm with you I think it's like a three out of ten in terms of my confidence that Illinois yeah. can come away with a win but you play the game a hundred times you maybe win it one maybe you win it two three you, oh, that's all you need and, you know, weird, weird stuff happens in the NCAA tournament. We've seen certainly a lot worse teams than Illinois they're, make it to the Final Four. They're going to need a big game from Damask. As much as, like, Shannon has to go for probably 30 in that game, Damask doesn't give them 15 to 20 points. They're not winning. Like, that, that is just how good UConn is. You have to have your two stars probably combined for 50 points. And then whatever else you may get from, whether it be Danger, Goody, uh, Gary A, like all those guys are going to have to be contributing. Shannon and Damascus are going to be the guys that are going to have to really settle that one I down. I will say this. I hadn't really thought about it yet. But so Illinois, um, to win it all, I oh, forgot. I can't get. I can't bet on it. I for, have no idea what the Roger because we can't bet yeah, on it. Yeah, I forgot Illinois. about that. If Where'd you're in a different state, like if you're listening to us right now from Pennsylvania or where, wherever. Well, thanks, first of all. Absolutely, Colorado, where, wherever you might be. Um I would recommend taking a look at what Illinois' odds are to be able to win that game or to be able to win the tournament because if they do get by UConn, their odds are going to go, like, way lower than they are today. 
I, I think it might end up being worth potentially placing a little bit of a bet there because your odds are going to be way lower on them to win against UConn than they are to win the tournament right now. Like the, the money line odds would, wouldn't be quite as good. I think it's probably worth a little bit of a bet there because if they do get past UConn, I think they're probably going to be labeled as the favorite at that point in time. Uh, all right. One other thing that I wanted to get to from this year's NCAA tournament. Alex, I use Ken Palm as kind of my guide. Um, for who the best teams are in college basketball. Instead of going by points per game, they go by offensive efficiency. If, instead of going by defensive points per game, they go by defensive efficiency. So it's basically what is your efficiency as opposed to how many points do you score? The reason why that's important is because some teams play way faster than others, and that will skew how many points you end up scoring, right? So this year, if you look at the most efficient offenses in the country, you look at the 10 most efficient offenses in the country, seven of them, are still playing right now in the NCAA tournament. Those teams that are not remaining, Baylor, Kentucky, and Auburn. Those are the only three teams out of the top 10 most efficient offenses that are no longer playing. Baylor and Auburn, unfortunately from the same region, didn't work out for them. Kentucky, we all knew. They're one of the the most erratic teams in the country. They can look great one day and look terrible the next. We knew they were going to be one of the teams that was like up and down erratic, depending on what happens. If you're looking at defenses, the best defenses in the country in terms of efficiency, if you look at the top 14, only three of them remain. Of those teams, only UConn has made it to the Elite Eight so far. The other two are Houston and Tennessee. So why am I bringing this up? BK, what's the point of all of this? You're just going to complain about your bracket where you had no, Auburn no, going no, all no, the no, way. No, 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 not at all. Although that is one of the takeaways you could have potentially <laughs> or something like this. <laughs> the reason why I find it to be really interesting, this year there is a very clear divide on what is winning in the tournament. The teams that are winning are the teams that have the best offenses. I do not know if this will be sticky. I do not know if this is something that's going to sustain for 2025 and beyond. But for at least this year's tournament, the teams that are winning are the teams that have the best offenses in the country this year. In the past, a lot of the time, it's been the defense that ends up winning out. We saw an example of this last night with Illinois versus Iowa State. I've been a little surprised by how often the offense is beating the defense this year in the tournament. And I do wonder if it's like, hey, you've got older players that are more efficient, that know what to do in these big games. Is that playing into it? That's just my hypothesis. I don't know exactly why this is taking place, but offense is beating defense right now in the tournament. The other thing about that, too, is and it feels like if you're, if you're a team based solely on defense, when you get into foul trouble, you have to change your game. And it felt like Iowa had to do that at times in the last game, whereas offensively, you're not changing your game or anything. You're still going out there performing. It feels like if you're a defensive-minded team and you play a certain way, when things start to go erratic, there's nowhere else for you to change, where at least Illinois has somewhere to go when it when it goes haywire. I, I feel like and maybe it's just me, and I, look, Illinois didn't shoot the ball necessarily great last night. I think shooting's just better than it's been in college basketball lately, and it's more, explo well, that's true. Yeah. more explosive than I think it's ever been. And, and I think with that being the case, it's why, like, yeah, I think that you need to have a good defense. Like, I, the Illinois would not have beaten Iowa State if they didn't play solid defense last night. Like, you have to have that. But if you don't have an offense, like Illinois, the reason I liked the matchup against Iowa State kind of, and I also liked the matchup against Duquesne in the second round, was because they were defensive teams but weren't great offensively. So I said, okay, well, the best I think that these teams can do is I think you can hold the Illini to about 70 points. That's what Iowa State did last night. But were you going to have enough offense to be able to put up over 72 points in that game? And the answer for Iowa State was no. And that's why I think these defensive-minded teams – are really struggling. I don't think they have the balance. I, I think you have to have a real. If you had a really great defense paired with a really solid offense, you would be fine. Problem is, is we're seeing that sometimes you're not getting that balance. That's what happened to yeah. Duquesne in, against Illinois. That's what happened with Iowa State. They were not good enough offensively to be able to get past the Illini. If you look, by the way, at the odds right now to win the NCAA tournament, UConn is like basically even money, which is amazing. Normally, that's the case for like a game. They are that to win their next three games. If you're looking for Illinois, you could get it at like 18 to 1 right now for them to win the NCAA yeah. tournament. I actually think that's that's pretty good value on Illinois because if they win this game against UConn, they'll go down to like 4 to 1. Well, and I had a buddy text me that said you can bet on Illinois at retail locations. You just can't bet on them mobily. There you go. So there you go. So if you want to drive up to uh, Chicago, they, yeah. they do trip. have a Circa no. Sports um, book up there in Chicago. There so if you want to do that for this weekend, Road trip. Uh, you could potentially go back on Illinois. All right. Sorry, buddy. You and I can go, not BK. For the games today, 
You got NC State versus Marquette, Gonzaga versus Purdue, Duke versus Houston, and Creighton versus Tennessee. The one game that I'm super interested in is Creighton versus Tennessee. I do think Gonzaga has a real chance, though, to be able to upset Purdue in this one as well. So uh, I think Purdue's be second best team in the tournament. Still, I actually love Purdue in that yeah, one. 314 399 9646 is the Air Comfort Service text line. Ask us anything coming up next.
wall blues coverage is right here. 101 ESPN is live from the Centene Community Ice Center. Brought to you by Bud Light and E&B Granite. Bernie Federko's only choice for granite countertops, cabinets, and flooring. You've got questions. We may have the answers. Maybe. It's BK and Ferrario's questions and answers on 101 ESPN. Six is the air comfort service tax line for Ask Us Anything. If you guys have any questions, sports or otherwise, go ahead and get those in right now from the air comfort service tax line. Alex, what's more concerning, the Blues offense or the Blues defense? I would say the Blues defense because you've got, you're going to have potentially five guys by the end of the season with 25 or more goals. And then next season, you're talking about more playing time for Zach Bolduc, who I thought showcased his offense last night. Uh, I actually thought that line was your best line for most of the game. And you're going to have Jimmy Snuggerud. It's just going to come down to chemistry on offense and getting the right coach in. Uh, I think the defense is the part that I'm concerned with because I love Nick Letty. I think Letty has played great this year. But I think Nick Letty at best is a second pair defenseman. And if I could find somebody to play with Colton Pareko, I'm talking about a Nick Letty and a Matt Kessel as my second pair and Tori Krug and whomever on my third pair. That's a six pair defenseman that I can get on board with. 314-399-9646 is the air comfort service text line. Guys, Chris Kerber said on the broadcast last night that Robert Thomas spends more time on the ice against the other team's top line than any player in the NHL, hey. even more than Sidney Crosby. He stole that from us. We stole, we stole that from, from the, the athletic. athletic. <laughs> Should that be viewed as a positive or a negative? Because it does seem to indicate that you don't have enough center depth to be able to push that low to somebody else and not have it go against your top guy. Is that something that the Blues are lacking in your opinion? I, I don't know how you can look at that as a negative. I want my best centerman to go up against the best. I mean, understand he's going up against the other team's best players and has 74 points this season. And that's... And that's as a 24-year-old. Like, imagine what he looks like at 25, 26, 27. He's got more points than Alexander Barkov right now. And he's arguably played well against the other team's top lines. It comes down to your depth going up against the other team's depth. So I, I don't see how you could find a negative in Robert Thomas playing against the other team's top lines. My one concern would be like, not that he's do he's doing it, but how often he's doing it. You would probably like to see them be able to exploit some matchups at times as yeah. well. But I think the only way you can do that is if you trust your second line, that oh, yeah. center, to be able to maintain that load as well. And right now, I don't think you can. I, I think so that would be my one pushback. Especially it. because, I mean, and this is going to sound mean, but it's because you have Kairu. Like, if Kairu's on my second line, I can't put that second line out there against the other team's top line. Because that line is going to get exploited on the ice and your third line as it stands is going to be Kevin Hayes and I'm not sure you could do that with younger players the only line you can have go up against the other team's top line is that but that's why you have a two-way centerman if he's creating offense and shutting down the other teams well that I mean that's this is the perfect scenario for the Blues this is what the LA Kings have survived with Andre Kopitar. This is what the Florida Panthers have survived with with Alexander Barkov, and he's showcasing the ability to be a 70-plus point player. Uh, guys, what's your favorite place to go for a good steak in the area? A good steak? Uh, my house. I make incredible steaks. Well, my pit boss in my backyard. This is going to be a uh, controversial take. Texas Roadhouse. No, no. I, uh, I don't. There's nothing wrong with it. Well, like, he likes Olive Garden, really too, like for the steak. Italians. I, I wouldn't. I would Neither not does seek BK. Out, I would not. I know. He's I would, vegetarian. I would not seek out a place to go get a steak, to be honest with you. I never make steaks at my house. I never do. See, it's weird. I, I like, I won't get a steak at just a, like any, like a chain restaurant. I, I will only get steak at certain places. But I can't name one off the top of my head because I just don't order steaks that often when I go out. A great vegetarian spot in the area is called Bombay Food Junkies. So, so that's, that's not really a steak, though. 314 uh, <laughs> is the Air Comfort Service text line. No, I just wanted to make to sure Chick that I had right. uh, Questions and answers. Guys, can you trust a lineup that has two rookies in it that only provide defense as opposed to offense based on what we saw yesterday? I think so. Um, I am not as concerned about the offense based on what we saw in one day of baseball. Uh, I know my co-host Alex Ferrario would disagree with that, and that's totally fair. I think that you having two guys in there for defense exclusively that have a little bit of speed, I don't have a problem with that. In fact, I mean, one of those two guys is one of three players that made yeah. it on base safely yesterday. I mean, again, so. I'll, I'll say this 
like we said about a week ago, if we're if we're complaining about this offense because you have Mason Wynn and Victor Scott in it, you're complaining about the wrong thing. There are seven other guys that should be mashing so that we're not even talking about those two. And if those two are the ones we're whining about because they can't hit, you got problems other than those two guys. 314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service text line. I do want to hear from you coming up in the next segment. Miles Michaelis has been very outspoken over the last 48 hours or so. He's made some comments that have stirred a little bit of controversy, I think it's fair to say. What has been our opinion of the Miles Michaelis heel turn? We'll get into that here from you guys as well next year on BK and Ferrario. It's 101. On and off the ice with the Last Minute Blues Podcast with Jamie Rivers and Donny Fandango of 105.7 The Point. Blues opinion, talk, and speculation. It's what we do. Download the Last Minute Blues Podcast on the 101 mobile app or at 101ESPN.com. 
Blues Talk more often. 101 ESPN is live from the Centene Community Ice Center. Brought to you by Bud Light and E&B Granite. Bernie Federko's only choice for granite countertops, cabinets, and flooring. provided some billboard material for the Dodgers coming into this opening day start. And they all might be a little extra focus because of that, Joe. The checkbook team, in some ways, he was kind of putting it. And boy, oh boy, yes, you can go out and get great players. And yes, you can pay them well because they are great. You put them all together and you have the Dodgers. Yeah, I will say this. I am buying a ticket to the movie that shows the game between the checkbook players and the Midwest <laughs> Farmers. That sounds intriguing to me. That's what it sounded like yesterday on the Dodgers broadcast as they have a little bit of fun with Miles Michaelis' comments. Miles Michaelis has had a bit of a heel turn over the last few days. I'll be honest. I think I'm the only person in St. Louis that has enjoyed this. Unfortunately, if you're going to make the kinds of comments that Miles Michaelis has made over the past few days, you got to back it up with your performance on the field. And, and that there did was my not problem happen yesterday alongside Alex and T-Bone on BK. So here's what we have heard over the last, I think, six days via Miles Michaelis. First, he told Katie Wu, quote, it's fun to go out there and try to prove people wrong. I'm not going to tell people, tell all the people doubting us to eat. You know what? I'd like to. But in the off chance that I'm wrong, I look like an idiot. But in the chance that they're wrong and I'm right, that would be pretty neat. That's like saying no offense, F you, but I said no offense. He then said on Wednesday leading into the Dodger series, we're not exactly a low payroll team, but you've got the Dodgers playing checkbook baseball. And we're going to go out there and be the hardest working group of Midwestern <laughs> farmers that we can be out there. If there's a series you want to win early any time of the year, it's great to go out there and stick it to the Dodgers. Say it with me, T-Bone. If you can take a couple of those games, yeah. you leave feeling good and feeling like you're on a high note. <laughs> Then yesterday, after the game, I think this might have been a slight nudge, wink, wink, nudge, nudge towards Shohei Otani when he said, this one after I'm the okay game, with. <laughs> I'll play the Vegas odds. I'll roll the dice. I'll bet on that all day. That weak contact is going to turn into outs eventually. So, you know, I'll just keep rolling with that. Man, I must have watched a different game because that was a lot of hard contact to Miles Michael. Also, the one line that got me was at the uh, at the end of Ben Fredrickson's piece earlier today where he said, uh, you know, it's going to be real hard to take four games from us in a four-game series. There you go. It, come on, man. Say that after they don't take four games against you because now you've said that and they're going to take four games against you. So I do want to hear from you. 314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service text line. You can watch us on the uh, YouTube page as well, YouTube dot com slash 101 ESPN STL is where you go to find us the YouTube chat in the graveyard is often running there what do you guys think about Miles Michaelis kind of speaking out like this personally I'll give mine because I think I'm on the unpopular side of this I like it I, I wish we had more of this in Major League Baseball I don't mind the heel turn I don't mind somebody that's willing to say the things that'll get some fan reaction if I'm gonna have the opinion that I find Paul Goldschmidt to be like a boring player <laughs> i also have to be okay when a player comes out and says things that are a little more colorful and yeah it sucks when he doesn't go out there and perform afterwards but i, I like that miles michaelis is willing to go out there and kind of you know throw his weight around a little bit with his comments before the season i like that he's willing to be a little off on edge like i i enjoy that i also think it puts your team a little behind the eight ball when you make these kinds of comments and you're going against that kind of a team and you don't perform early in the season. So I'm of two minds with it, but if I had to like, hey, end of the day, where do you stand on this? I like it. I, I wish more players talked like this in the media. Look, I can't be a hypocrite and act like I love Jordan Bennington's heel turn and then sit here and act like I don't love Miles Michaelis's heel turn. I, I do like what he said about the Dodgers. Like, uh, I think that's great. I, I, everybody in Major League Baseball is thinking what Miles Michaelis said. Miles was just brave enough to say it, which I'm fine with. What I didn't like and think he needed to keep his mouth shut on was what he's told at Katie Wu of, oh, I'd love to tell the doubters to eat you know what, but I'm not going to. Miles. They're doubting you because your team looks bad on paper. And it's great that you've got that underdog mentality, 
but it's not a great recipe to tell the fan base to eat you know what because you're doubting us and then go out there and barely make it through five innings and give up five earned runs. That's the heel turn that I'm not on board with. When you do a heel turn against your own fan base, that's one thing. When you're making comments to other teams, I love that. It's just pick and choose when you're going to be a heel there, Miles. So I typically don't have an issue with a player coming out and speaking like, not that, not that one. I totally agree. Yeah, with that, that one, one was just dumb. The one on the Dodgers, I don't mind a little trash talk. Dude, this is like a third line center talking trash. Come on. You're not the guy to talk trash. No, you he's came, a second you're, line center. No, he's not. <laughs> he's like a fourth line center at this point in his career. His pitch of contact thing <laughs> stinks, and he got destroyed by the Dodgers. It was already going to be tough for him to get the Dodgers out without him being motivated, and then he poked the damn bear, and they kicked his freaking oh. you-know-what yesterday. He didn't poke the bear. He dangled a he, raw steak Mike, in front of the bear. Michael, this is not the guy I should be talking about. If Sonny Gray would have said this, yes. I would have been like, yes, that guy can go out and back it up. Yep. Michaels cannot back it up, guys. Michaels is not the guy that should be talking trash. I shouldn't hear Victor Scott going, man, that that Tyler Glass now, that fastball's slow. I can go hit that. Well, no, he's not going to do that. Like, Michaels, what are you talking about? Shut up. Yeah, I, I, I just, if you're not, if you're not the guy that you know you could go out there and back it up, it, it's tough to run your mouth. But again, I mean, he, he feels like he is, though. This is where I'm going to disagree with you guys. I think Michaelis believes he's that Sure, guy. and I heard Wayno say he was bouncing back last year. I know. And that's why, like, I have no problem but with again, it. But again, I have, I have no, no problem, problem with it at all. I have no problem with what he said about the Dodgers, even if you get blown up. like So which which one did you not like? I didn't like where he basically said, I'd love to tell all the doubters to eat you-know-what. That Why? Because you can't... You don't know what you are going to look like. But he's he's showing confidence in his guys. Fine, that's but you're that taking the, that's, that's him saying we we have a great group of pitchers. Prove it on the field but you first. Are, but you are pointing at the fan base by basically saying, you guys don't believe in us, so eat you know what. You're putting your entire fan base against you before you start the season. And, and I don't think is, he's saying it to his fans. I think he's saying it this to is the doubters because I'm a fan and a doubter. F fair, but I think what he's pointing to is like uh, there's a lot of people in the media, and you can look anywhere, like Wherever you want to do as uh, your national publication X, Y, or Z that is talking about the Cardinals and projecting their season, all of them have made reference, justifiably in my opinion, to the Cardinals pitching staff and especially the age of the Cardinals starters. Ken Rosenthal has been on a crusade, again, I think justifiably so, about the Cardinals rotation and why that is the thing that's going to let them down this year. So if you're Mike Liss and you're seeing this and hearing this, you're saying to yourself, I want to try to prove people like that wrong. I'd love to tell Ken Rosenthal, he might as well have just go, went ahead and said the name. He could have said our name. Eat, you know what? Well, yeah, I would have been fine with that. But he's not going to because on the off chance that I'm wrong, I thought this was a funny line, I look like an idiot. I, yeah, I got no problem with yesterday. that, man. I, th I think that he should have that kind of confidence in their staff. Now, we can all say you're crazy, Miles. You're crazy, John Mosaylock, for believing in this kind of a staff. But I would fully expect everybody within the organization, and especially the pitchers within the rotation, to believe that this is going to work even if we all think that they're wrong. I just think there's there's two different ty types of, of heel turn. There's a heel turn on teams, or there's a heel turn on, on, like, rivals in the game. That's the heel turn that everybody can get on board with. And then there's a heel turn against people that are watching you, and I felt like, even if you're right, where he's pointing more towards the national media, as a common fan of the Cardinals, you see that and you're like, oh, cool, we'll bleep you then. I, I think the part that I don't even really care about the heel turn so much. I think it, if you're Miles, I think it looks bad on him for heel turning at all, genuinely. I, the part that I don't like is if you're going to come out and have this whole, like, yeah, well, the, the media is wrong. We're, not, we're a good pitching staff. All right, don't say it publicly. Like, say Why? it internally. Hold it to yourself until you yeah. actually pitch well. At least get through the first round I, I, think you look, I think you look worse right now yeah. if you're Miles Mike. I do think it oh, looks well, bad. Screw the doubters. We're but really that's, good. That's the playing the results thing. Like, I, I, and you know how I feel, but I, I, I think it's for him coming off the year he had last year to be talking that big game of, like, how what can if, the media doubt me? I'd go, Alex, Miles, what I are think you talking you would, about? I think you would fit into this criteria, Alex. Well, so you better have this as a good statement. Because T-Bone's been consistent on this. Like, you, you didn't like it with the Benning and stuff you don't like it on my list like you you're just out on all of this totally fair I've been inconsistent. I didn't like it on the Bennington side of things. I do like it here with, well, with that's Michaelis. just because you hate Bennington. 
I thought the antics on the field with Bennington were the thing that I, I thought that he should the remove. Joke's on you, idiot. He's on the ice. He didn't really talk all that much like this. It was just mostly the, the on-ice stuff. That I, I didn't he only threw that. a water bottle off the ice, okay? And chucked a stick at somebody. I like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, the water bottle was deserved. <laughs> that Come was on. funny. <laughs> <laughs> Bennington just threw a water bottle He just bottle walks on. by him and chucks it in the middle of his post-game presser. It's amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. All right. Um, you liked the Bennington stuff. But you don't like this from Michaelis. But Bennington so never did a difference. Bennington never you. did a heel turn towards the fan base. Bennington did a heel turn towards. So that's what you're caught up on is the. Yeah, the I, I love what he did with the Dodgers. The with this. Okay. I love the Dodgers side of it. I don't like what he said with Katie in terms of for the people that don't believe in us, eat ish. I think that's a bad look for people that deservedly so have a lot of doubt about this team. I think silent confidence would have been better in that category. I think if if the comments to Katie Wu for Miles Michaelis would have been, there's a lot of people that don't believe in us, we'll prove you wrong. I think that would have been a great comment, even if you looked like trash. So it's the colorful language that it's he the, used. That was it's the foul <laughs> language that he used. And if you know me, I say that real tongue-in-cheek. I'm like the damn Sopranos around these parts. Uh, it, it's, not e it's not even the language. It's just the way that it was like, ah, for anybody that doubts this, I'd like to tell you to eat ish, but I won't. Okay, but you essentially did. Yeah, he and, did. That's and, what he did. And guess what? A lot of people doubt you. And then you just went out and did that. Now people are going to hate you even more for what you said and what you just did on the field. And, and look, Miles, I know you're probably listening to the show because you clearly pointed out a lot of the national. Yeah, he was field. talking about it. I'm us. not going to tell you that the old pitchers in this staff outside of Sonny Gray suck. Okay? I'm not going to do that. I'd like to. But in the off chance I'm wrong, I would look like an idiot. But in the chance that you're wrong and I'm right, that would be pretty neat. That would be my response to Miles Michaelis in this Fair. rotation. And I would say I think he would probably tell you, cool. I, I think Miles has – he'd probably use foul language at me. Yeah, I can't probably. because of some FCC thing. Yeah. I, Podcast later. <laughs> I hope he proves everybody wrong. I hope he's right, honestly. The best thing for all of us is that Michaelis' confidence – actually ends up turning out to be correct. That's not a good start. Not a good start at all. I, I, the performance against the Dodgers made him look bad, and I think he is willing to admit as much. I think he did admit as much after the game last night, where he's like, yeah, you know, like, not the way that we wanted to start. I kind of liked his comment about the whole, uh, I'll bet on the soft contact. Now, I love that. <laughs> I think that would be a better way to go about things. His performance yesterday was not up to par. It, it wasn't. I, I do think that the us against the world mentality is exactly what this team could potentially try to like latch onto. I, I do think there's value yeah, in but, that. But and you have to have the Jordan talent to back up the I was Jordan say, comments. You need talent if you're going to go that yeah, route. Yeah, and I don't. I don't believe the pitching staff does. I, maybe, but if you're them, like create that mentality of yeah, all of you losers think that we're not going to be good enough this year. We're good enough. We believe in ourselves. And it may not end up working out. It probably will not end up working out. But it wasn't going to work out anyway, so at least this is more fun. At least this is something that's a little bit more is interesting. Because I'm not having fun. He made I'm me more feel frustrated. personally attacked. It, and it goes to what we said yesterday. You know, we did the whole vibes check. And, man, would yeah. I love to have done that today. <laughs> um, but we did the whole vibes, you've check, given your to vibes open, check to open the season. <laughs> And I said, why do I? Why? Why are my vibes low on this team? It wasn't about the offense. You know, they didn't have a great showing yesterday. It was about the rotation. My my lack of faith in the rotation and the Cardinals and now Michaelis telling me that I, oh I should believe in this rotation when I can look at just numbers and say this should not work. There's no belief that this should work, and yet here I am being told you don't know baseball, you don't know pitching, you should trust in this rotation. I, I what? Just, I think silence is, does a lot more. More benefit to this team than what happened with miles because yeah. now everybody is going not even that it's bulletin board material everybody was everybody is going to be like oh, okay let's see what you have to offer every time that rotation steps on the mound now and gives up five earned runs they're gonna be like oh guess we can eat ish for not believing in you guys and i think that's fun I'm, I prefer it that way. I, at this least is why that you're a is jerk. Semi interesting as opposed to what the Cardinals have been in recent seasons. All right. Alex I want Steve more on, Goldie. K. Jordan Deacon back in the studio for us today, running the board for us, doing a fantastic job. We're broadcasting live, by the way, at the EB Granite Studios out at the Centene Community Ice Center. Coming up in 15 minutes, we will talk about Victor Scott, his debut, what we saw from him. But next, the Blues are building the core group of players that are necessary to make the playoffs. There's one statistic that has shown up in recent days that. I think speaks to it. We'll talk about it next. You're on 101 ESPN.
to more exclusive blues talk. 101 ESPN is live from the Centene Community Ice Center. Brought to you by Bud Light and E&B Granite. Bernie Federko's only choice for granite countertops, cabinets, and flooring. Alongside Alex and T-Bone, I'm BK. You got BK and Ferrario here on 101 ESPN. Alex, this blue season, a lot of it has been about, like, can this team build the core for what they're going to be in the future? Yes, they're still technically alive for the postseason. We'll talk a little bit about that throughout the course of the day today. But really, this season was always about the retool. And can they build some of the pieces that are going to be here in 25, 26, 27 that could potentially do something more meaningful? And for much of the season, our answer to that question was like, uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's really happening. But over the last couple of months, I think that's changed. I, I think Jake Neighbors has become a, a firm piece of the top six for future seasons. Robert Thomas has emerged as a legitimate number one center. I think at least one of Jordan Kyber or Pavel Buchnevich yeah. should be here for the long term. I think you can build around one of those guys in your top six as well. It's a big piece of what you're trying to accomplish. But we brought this up before the show today, and we were looking it up because you now have three 25-goal scorers on this team. Pavel Buchnevich, Jordan Cairo, Jake Neighbors. I don't think any of us really predicted that Jake Neighbors would be a part of that, but he's found a way to do it. So three 25-goal scores. There are currently nine other teams in the NHL this season that have at least three 25-goal scores. They are as follows. Dallas, Toronto, Colorado, Tampa Bay, the New York Rangers, the Edmonton Oilers, Minnesota, Vancouver, and Vegas. Guys, every single one of those nine teams would currently be in the playoffs if the season ended today. You're with the, only with the one. exception of Minnesota. Shoot, yes. Yeah, so, so Minnesota and St. Louis. Excuse me. Take two. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> Eight of the, the other ten. nine teams. <laughs> Eight of the other nine teams <laughs> would make the playoffs today. The one exception is the team that has $20 million of dead yes. money towards the cap this year. They cannot use a quarter of their cap space yep. because of buyouts that took place multiple seasons ago. Yes. So let's use that Nailed as the, uh, the other disclaimer here. What does that speak to you, Alex? Uh, I mean, it tells me that all of the doubts about this offense should be gone. Now, uh, I think the important caveat into this conversation is what you mentioned in terms of one of Kairou or Buchnevich. You know, if you pluck one of those guys off of this roster, are you replacing it with another 25 goal scorer? But look, uh, it tells me that one, your offense is in good shape because by the end of the season, you could be talking about five guys with 25 or more goals because Brandon Saad is one away. Robert Thomas, I think, is three away. So, uh, like, you're talking about five guys, which I don't think any team has five or more players with 25 plus goals. Just four. Dallas is the only one yeah. for offense is there and you're talking about adding in a Jimmy Snuggerud next season it, it also tells me that you got to fix your defense it tells me that if you want this to go in the other direction you know you got the offensive pieces you're growing some of these younger players you've got the big name players specifically because of Jake neighbors breakthrough you got to find a way to make your defense better because if you've got the offense in the same category as all of those teams that you just mentioned well, all but Minnesota are playoff teams. And guess what? All but Minnesota have great goaltending. Guess what? All but Minnesota have a very good defense. You got to fix that one area while your offense is continuing to grow. Is it weird that I don't know how to feel about those offensive sure. numbers? Because though on when you just say those numbers, it is, wow, this offense seems really good. Yeah. It, but when I look at like under the hood and peek under the hood, Five-on-five-wise, five they're third worst in Corsi percentage for, and they're near the bottom of the league in expected goals for. So how can I explain that necessarily? It makes me think that the power play has really propelled a lot of these guys forward here to get to this mark that we're talking about. Which I, is odd because the power play hasn't been great. A lot of these but, goals are even strength goals. But it, it turned around under Bannister. So, like, mm. I don't know how to feel about these numbers because, like, when I think of the St. Louis Blues, I go, okay, defensively they are not I, – I don't think they're very good at getting bailed out by Bennington. And then when I think about the Blues offensively, I would have had no idea that they had those many – But shouldn't that give you more optimism because this team is bad at five-on-five. Five. They have no sustained offensive zone time, and you've got three guys who already have 25-plus goals. Imagine what it looks like when you get more sustained offensive zone time and more consistency, which I would argue comes from getting yourself a number-one defenseman to keep play alive. I, my 
my counter to that, and I think you're probably right, though, is, you know, when I look under the hood, should I be really buying into what I'm seeing? That, that's what my question would be. Should I buy, and what we're talking about here, when I can look under the hood and go, this says that it should not be happening? That, that's what my counter to that would be, and that's why, like, it's, they're a different team, and they're in a different spot, and they're retooled. But wouldn't, it be diff- wouldn't it be different, though? Like, Because when we had the conversation about Barbashev being that point scorer, and we were like, guys, like this is not sustainable. Uh, is there anybody on this list that you look at and you say that's not sustainable of being a 25-plus goal scorer? I, I think the one you'd point to is potentially what you're getting right now out of Jake Neighbors. And yeah. if Jake Neighbors does, and I agree, I think Neighbors has to do this next year for you to buy into consistency. Otherwise, it is Barbashev. But if he does it again next year, there's nobody else on that list that you look at and you say, well, that's not sustainable. I mean, age with Brandon Saad, maybe, but you know every season he's 20 goals. You know Robert Thomas is going to be there. If you move one of Kyrou or Buchnevich, you're expecting to put in another 25-plus goal scorer. I mean, again, being so bad at even strength this season and your power play not being great all season and still getting those results – Imagine what it looks like when you tighten up those problems and make it a little bit more sustainable. Yeah, and, and like, I, I'm not even necessarily, like, disagreeing with what you're saying in terms of them having these 25-goal scores and the offense, like, hey, look, the offense isn't a problem because I think you're right. If Neighbors ends up doing it next year, then, yeah, I think you can say, okay, we know what we have in these guys offensively, and I totally buy on what they're doing. And honestly, I probably actually lean towards buying in what Jake, Jake Neighbors is doing yeah. because he's parking himself in front of the net. This isn't like he's got a high shooting percentage. Like, he's taking a bunch of shots from, like, the outside, and all of a sudden he's got, like, this – Tarasenko slash Cairo Rister right. that he's using to score goals. No, he's parking himself in front of the net, getting rebounds and scoring. That that seems sustainable in my opinion. But it is interesting that those numbers are there for this offense. And the reason I just don't know how to feel about it is because I still look at them as a team and go, the five on five offense is not very good. Somebody on the text line um, said something that I found to be pretty interesting. And by the way, three one four three nine 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 six four six is the Air Comfort Service text line. Guys, one of the issues is that the Blues have a bunch of players that are like right right around that 20 to 25 goal scoring range. And these other teams that are in that same thing have guys that have scored like 30 plus. Exactly. There's actually some truth to that. Like of the teams that have the three goal scores of 25 or more, uh, seven of the 10 have multiple 30 plus goal scores. Yeah. Yeah. The blues, the stars and the Vegas golden Knights are the only teams that do not fit into that criteria. So like Toronto, for example, uh, they, they've got guys that are yeah, not I mean, just in the, the 25 goal scoring. you got two guys that are Rocket Rajard conversation. A- exactly, and that's that's the thing that is different is the Blues, and this has always been Doug Armstrong's philosophy. They're trying to do it with that pack mentality again, right? That's mm-hmm. what this roster is supposed to be for now and for the future. They're going to have to have, what was it, six 20-goal scores that year, that 2022? The, yeah, when they went I actually the think it was nine 20-goal scores, was it, wasn't was it? Nine? I thought it was nine. I'd have to go back and look at the exact number. Yeah, but it's 21-22, wasn't it? I believe so, yeah. yeah. They uh, ended up that season with, yeah, nine 20-goal 20 20 scores. scores. That's what you're going to have to build. If you're building this way where you've got a bunch of guys, kind of like uh, a team in baseball that has no 40 home run hitters but has a bunch of guys that are in that 20 home run category. In fact, that's kind of what the Cardinals have been for, for the last few seasons. Yeah, and that those numbers, by the way, you had three lines that never gave an, a team the opportunity to breathe. And then you had a fourth line that was Oscar Sundquist, Nathan Walker, Tyler Bozak, and Dakota Joshua. Exactly. You go back to that team, and it was like, okay, every single player in your top nine that season, every single one of them, was a threat to score 20 goals over the course of the year. It's just relentless. And right now, that's my takeaway from this is, okay, it's really cool that the Blues, like, their top six, essentially, kind of fitting into what you're talking about around the NHL, of teams that have legit goal-scoring threats on their in their top six. The problem is you are missing, essentially, a full line of players that can contribute the way that you need to in order to be a real contender in the NHL right now. You've got to have another... You either have to develop somebody that has a 40-goal scorer consistently, or you've got to fill out the middle of this lineup with legitimate threats to score 20 goals next year. It's got to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. And until you do that, this is great. It speaks to them, like, being able to develop from within. Kairou, Neighbors. I think Robert Thomas is going to be on this list of 25 goal scorers by the end of the season. You've got a lot of that that is helpful. Now you've got to do the next piece of it, which is hopefully next year, Jimmy Snuggerud could be added to this list. Maybe Zach Bolduc takes a massive step forward and he becomes a 20-goal scorer. Uh, maybe you're able to have Dvorsky two years from now. That is a 20-goal scorer for the Blues. That's the next piece of what we're talking about here. Final thing on this, Alex, before we get out. 
Are you rooting for Jimmy Snuggerud to be at the NHL level by the end of this season, or at this point are you rooting for his team to continue to win in the tournament? Uh, I'm ashamed to say that last night I was rooting against Jimmy Snuggerud, um, and I understand we all want Jimmy Snuggerud to have so much success and win a Frozen Four, but there was a little part of me that was like come on Omaha find a way to take down the Golden Gophers so Jimmy Snuggerud because I mean they lose last night you're probably talking about Snuggerud being on this team by Saturday to play against the Edmonton Oilers if it all goes quickly yep. enough um, but now that you've gotten past that first round, he's got a tough matchup. His team does against that Boston University, which has that uh, Macklin Celebrini that's going to go first overall in this upcoming draft. I, I think I'm rooting for it until it gets to the point where it's less than five games. Because if it's less than five games, don't burn a year of it. Put him in the AHL and let him play three, four, five games and then let him start next year. But if, if you could get him to where you're playing five, six games at the NHL level, I'd like to see it. I, I know it burns a year of the contract, but as Doug Armstrong told us, I think that's a good problem if he comes here and lights it up for two straight years and you have to pay him a lot of money after you've burned a year of his contract. I'd like to see it because I want to know – do we have a goal scorer next season? Because if so, now I could get more aggressive in the offseason. Or is this guy going to have a lot more work behind it before we get him to that level? If so, well, now we don't do too much. I think Snuggerud unlocks a lot of what they do in the offseason. I'm rooting for him to continue to win and to get to the championship game. I always knew you were pro uh, tampering in terms of the allowing the guys yeah, to service time. time. Well, he's John Mosellock's puppet boy. Of course he is. Yeah. Yeah. If, his, if it was BK's world, Victor Scott would be starting in Memphis. He wanted him there. I, I know just, he did. I am excited to see Jimmy Snuggerud, and I can't wait for that to happen in the 2024-2025 season. I think it's the best thing for everybody involved. Wouldn't you like to know, though, going into the offseason, if Snuggerud's a goal scorer to where you say, hey, maybe I'm not going to learn that. Yeah, I'm not going to learn that in these seven, eight, nine games. Not even I mean, let's be honest. Let's did you learn anything about Vrana when he came here after Kapanen. the deadline? Kapanen, like the, the those guys were, were different though because but no, the I knew I'm they were a reclamation project. Do you feel project. like you can learn something from Zach Dean in these final eight games? I don't think he's the same profile of a prospect as Snuggerud is. Like in Matthew Nyes played one game for Toronto last year, and I said that dude's a top six forward. Let me ask this a different way: Do you? How much do you feel like we've been able to learn about Zach Bolduc? He's played in seventeen games, so he's played twice as many games already as what we would see from Jimmy Snuggerud. And I don't know that we've learned a ton so far. No, I'm with you there. And I think that's more usage than anything. I, I would be on the stance of play the guy more so I can learn more about it. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, that comes down to just – that's the part that I, that's the unknown. He's not playing him in the top six. And, and if that's the case, then I'm on your side of it. Don't bring him over. He's not going to play over Kairou. He's not going to play over neighbors. If you bring him over here, you have to play him in the top six. And if you don't put him in the top six, then I'd say put him in the AHL. Coming up in about 15 minutes, this is a really important start coming up for Zach Thompson. And are we going to see his velocity ramp up in a way that we didn't for much of spring training? We'll talk about that coming up at 1 o'clock. But next, Victor Scott showed us his value in his first career major league game. We'll talk about it next year on 101 ESPN.
101 ESPN Sports Center. I'm Jordan Deacon. The Sports Center update is brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. Yesterday was opening day for the MLB, and the St. Louis Cardinals did not have a great start as they lost 7 1 to the Los Angeles Dodgers. They continued their first road trip of the season facing LA again tonight. It's a late one with first pitch at 9 10, and Zach Thompson will kick things off on the mound for the Cardinals. St. Louis City SC is also getting back into action tomorrow night in Utah, taking on Real Salt Lake. Kickoff is set for 8 30. And all weekend long, we've got Ma March Madness coming coverage for you right here on 101 ESPN beginning tonight starting at 6 right after the fast lane. I'm Jordan Deacon. This Sports Center update was brought to you by Saliga. Heating and cooling, an independent American standard heating and air conditioning dealer. Wall to wall blues coverage is right here. 101 ESPN is live from the Centene Community Ice Center. Brought to you by Bud Light and EMB Granite. Bernie Federko's only choice for granite countertops, cabinets, and flooring. The opening day center fielder for the Cardinals. Punches this one left side to Mookie Betts. Low throw gets by Freeman. So Scott's biggest ability is his speed. And Betts certainly knew that there. There he goes. Throw from Smith. Not in time. And the first stolen base of Victor Scott's major league career. That's what it sounded like yesterday on the Dodgers broadcast. Victor Scott reaches base for the first time on an error and then steals his first base of his major league career. He steals a base before he gets a hit. It's very fitting for what Victor Scott profiles as as a major leaguer. With Should've Alex and T-Bone, I'm BK. You got BK and Ferrario here on 101 ESPN. Guys, I loved what we saw from Victor Scott yesterday. You see the pressure that he puts onto a defense. He immediately gets that first stolen base. Love get, seeing him get that out of the way. His defense in center was excellent. I love the flair, the pizzazz that he has. He finishes an inning with a catch in center field as he's kind of, I think it was floating to his left, if I'm not mistaken. And he goes up and he just kind of does the, the one-handed grab up in the air. I'm sure that Cardinals fans had their heart skip a beat as that took place, just waiting for him to drop it. Did he catch it? He two did. hands, young pup. No, two you hands. don't need two hands when you're Victor Scott. I love everything that he brings to the table. And after one game of watching him, guys, I'm willing to make this ridiculous statement, which is he should never go back down to the minor well, I don't. I don't think that's a ridiculous statement. <laughs> I am ready to just watch this kid just thrive at the major league level. I don't know what his bat's going to be. Like, he, he's probably going to be overmatched more often than not. And could this be something that is ultimately a detriment to his, his long-term development? Yeah, it, it absolutely could be the case. And I'm being reckless and totally irrational here. I just want to see it, man. I want to see it with the major league club. I want him to be a part of this lineup for years to come. I, I I had so much fun watching him in in game one. He again speaks to everything that I love in a major league baseball player of the speed, the defense, playing center field, doing it with some pizzazz, bringing up the '80s Cardinals, the Whitey Ball right before the game, saying that he understands the history of this team and why it matters to that this was fan a base. Good like, PR move, dude. All of it just speaks to. Yeah, this guy's a cardinal through. I mean, I don't think it's a ridiculous statement. I went up there watching Nolan Gorman just go swinging all the time and getting two strikeouts. Jordan Walker Whoa. went three straight swings and went down swinging. I love what, what Victor Scott provided. First of all, the defense. I, I understand we all like Tommy Edmond as a center fielder. Tommy Edmond can't even hold a candle up to what Victor Scott can do at center field. And, and I, I think that solely should keep him up on this team especially with the pitch to contact that these pitchers are going to be this season but then that stolen base and I get it was only one stolen base but he made it flawless I mean he was he was in against every single catcher in Major League Baseball I don't think anybody was throwing they that no dude chance. out at second base and that was just the first stolen base imagine the nerves that he had in Dodgers or in uh, Chavez Ravine against the Dodgers with Glass now on the mound, and you're thinking, man, this is my first opportunity, and that dude made it flawless. I don't care what his bat looks like. I've said it throughout spring training, and I'll say it again. We're going to have a ton of dudes that are going to be swinging and missing all the time. I want that guy in my lineup because when he gets on base, which should have been a hit, by the way. I think it was <laughs> BS that that was an error, but he is going to steal bags for you. I, I, I'm with you. I will make the exclamation now, dude should never go back to the minor leagues. 
Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm willing to declare that no, just yet. Of course not. You love yeah, tampering. Well, well, no, I loved putting him on the opening roster. I was the one that was on the station just banging the drum to get him on this opening day roster. Well, you guys are like, well, no, I was going to send him down. I was like, no, he can't send him down. He did. Uh, but, so Jordan Walker just tackled the center fielder. <laughs> <laughs> but High load him. I, I, I think it, I'm fascinated to know how his bat's going to look. I didn't necessarily feel like he was like really overmatched yesterday like Mason Wynn was. Yeah, I felt it, like he saw the strike zone yeah, pretty well. I, I thought he was fine. I, I think he was maybe a little overpowered, but the whole lineup looked overpowered against Tyler Glass now. So, like, you know, we'll see as time moves on. long as he doesn't look overmatched, and this isn't a shot against the Mason Wynn, Mason Wynn looked overmatched last year down the stretch. For sure. And he's going to make those adjustments. We'll see how he looks here as this season gets going. As long as he doesn't look like that, yeah, he, to me, he stays up here. I, but I'm not going to declare it on day one just because of the defense and the speed. Coward. I do think today and on Sunday, those will be better, more telling examples of whether or not he's, like, ready for what it takes to win at this level. Gavin Stone, Bobby Miller, those are young starting pitchers that are not the same level of difficulty as going yeah. up against a guy like Tyler Glass now. Now, Yamamoto's a little different. He's probably never seen a pitcher that oh, profiles. I, I thought you were going because Siani's probably going to start Saturday. So oh, no. I thought well, that that's true. Really Scott's probably not going to play I one of those games. About that today. Um, I, I don't think that Yamamoto is a profile of pitcher that he's seen at any point in yeah. his minor league career. So that, that could be a real I will be tough day for him. I will be interested, though, how he performs in that game because for somebody that a lot of people don't have the script out on, how does he look in that type of matchup? Plus, I mean, we saw Yamamoto in spring. It's not like he's got overwhelming stuff he i think he does have overwhelming stuff i don't think he has command yet and that is like a lot of the pitchers that he saw in the minors have that issue but his stuff is so much better than yeah. anything that he's seen in yeah. the minor league so i i'm not going to judge him based on what we see on saturday I, I loved what we saw in game one i hope we see more of that as uh things continue to go along the one guy that i didn't love what we saw was riley o'brien who has excellent stuff and speaking of guy that can't command it oh boy circle of trust that remember riley o'brien he did not make it Thanks to Alex and T. Yeah, I was going to say somebody nominated him <laughs> off of Stuff Alone, which, by the way, Stuff almost took Mookie Betts' head off three times. Yeah, three straight pitches that went right to the head. But you know what Betts. I love about it? Riley O'Brien said, this almost killed that guy. I'm going to throw the same pitch. Not once, but twice more. Yeah. Uh, then he struck out Shohei Otani. Like, you saw the good and the bad. The good was strikeout swinging on Otani. Well, Otani the had bad a parlay. was walking Mookie Betts on five pitches with three of them being completely non-competitive <laughs> pitches. That's the fear. That's always been the profile for Riley O'Brien. I do think some of this was just like nerves because I'll give him the benefit of doubt Absolutely. There. I think he was super nervous because you saw um, it, pitching coach come out there midway through the at, that at-bat. I think it was against Mookie Betts, Otani. actually. It was against Otani. Yeah. He said, hey, you're good. You could read his lips. It was not hard to read him. Um, he's like, you're good. You're fine. Yeah. We're going to be okay here. Just settle in. You're good. And from there, he, he did look a little better. Yes, he did give up the single. He gave up the run. But I, I thought overall, so a lot of that can be chalked up to, yeah, he gave up five runs. <laughs> uh, a lot of that could be chalked up to just, he was super nervous. It was a lot there. You're going up against the one, two, three in the best lineup <laughs> right. we've ever seen constructed. And welcome to the big leagues, kid. Yeah, g good luck. So I'm glad they got that out of the way for him. He's he's done. It was in a non-competitive game already. But that was that was the bad of of the day. Yeah, I I, I that was the bad of the I day. Te I texted uh, the group. <laughs> yeah. Well, he it was, was only on... like the fourth worst thing that happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I texted our group chat while while he was on the mound, and you can see the stuff. It, I think it's going to remind you a lot of the Alex Reyes experience. And I'm not saying he's probably going to close that year that Reyes was healthy, but I think it's going to be like at times you're going to go wow. Wow, how does anybody hit him? And then there's also going to be times where it's like, wow, he might be blindfolded while he's throwing the baseball in the mouth. Which I'm, okay with. Where it's going with. I'm okay with because if he doesn't know where it's going to go, neither does the batter. He's got a lot or of Hennessy Cabrera to him. <laughs> well, that's true. You replaced Hennessy Cabrera essentially with Riley O'Brien, kind of similar in terms of the results. Some days it could be really good. Other days it's going to be really bad, and you'll know based on what happens against yeah. the first By batter. the way, can we also talk about Contreras and, and throw the stuff that he's a bad catcher out? Because I thought he looked good yesterday. I did too. I, I thought, thought the framing was really was good. Bad and oh, get the hell out of here. That's, yeah, sure. He's Alex. That's Debo and I'm VK. The Quality jump tour coming up next. Sucked. We got to talk about what happened with the fast lane yesterday.
Yeah. More blues talk, more often. 101 ESPN is live from the Centene Community Ice Center. Brought to you by Bud Light and E&B Granite. Bernie Federko's only choice for granite countertops, cabinets, and flooring. Let's open it up. The Junk Drawer with BK and Ferrario. Brought to you by Fenton Bar and Grill. Best trust wings in Missouri. Dine in. Carry out. Seven days a week. a budding controversy. What? What'd you do now, man? We. No. You. Were a part of a controversy that took place yesterday at about 2.03. Oh, did they catch me the gambling in the, in the studio? They <laughs> were very upset that we decided to play the lineup game. Uh, now. Sorry, it was the day game. It is worth noting the Cardinals' first pitch was at 3 o'clock yesterday. The Cardinals' lineup was ta- was sent out at 11.15. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'm going to go out on a limb and say I don't think that the fast lane was totally surprised by what the lineup was when they played the game at 2.10 yesterday. Just going to go out on a limb. I don't believe it. I think one of them at some point in their cheated? exhaustive research that we all know they do wow. prior to their game. I didn't know you are going to throw accusations out. Probably <laughs> saw the lineup. And so the whole idea idea of them not knowing what the lineup was and being shocked when they had Victor Scott batting eighth over ah, Mason win. What? I don't buy it. <laughs> you guys are good actors. I like every single one of you on that show. I'm not buying the uni esque That being said, Alex, they had a lot of words to say yesterday, specifically Jamie Rivers, who I love, about us stealing stuff from other shows. What? There was a lot of accusations thrown around. First of all, I would like it to be known. There is one show on this station that started out with the funerals. Yep. That started out with the, we'll see you later, goodbye, good night. The eulogies were started on one show, and one show and, only. And one co-host was a part of that show where they were started. And they seemingly found a way onto a new show upon that co-host's arrival on said show. Now, I would say if you're going to talk about stealing content, that is probably something that one could bring up. I'm not going to do that no, today. No, no, why would we do that? But if you wanted to talk about stealing content from another show, I would say it is something you could bring up. Bringing in that up things like that would just cause more controversy, BK. So we're better. We'll be the bigger individuals and say, you know what? Let's let that go. So, again, I'm going to set that aside. But here's what it <laughs> sounded like yesterday. As they decided to play the lineup game and really before then uh, accuse us of being the worst show and the worst kinds of humans oh. in this world. The lineup game is already played. Yeah. W- wait. Kind of. Wait, you played. all. I thought we just started the show. Did you all play the game already? Oh, no. No, no we didn't. BK and Ferrario? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Those, I, I like those guys. Do you? I do. Hmm. Still? Yeah. I, well, I got to rethink this now. Mm. So after the show. Andrew Marsh, who works his tail off most days, last night he did, <laughs> after the show, how long were you here, Marsh? I was here until 8.30. 8.30? That's now, right. typically, Marsh is out about 6.05. So Marsh here till 8.30 last night, good two, two and a half hours, normally, uh, longer than he normally is. And he's working on some new drops for the lineup game, and it was robbed. Oh, it was it. robbed by BK and Ferrario in the T-Bone. They T-boned us. So there were a few, a few that were spoiled today, unfortunately, for our listeners. They said during the lineup game segment, BK and Ferrario actually started that game, not Mm. this show. No. Oh, go right to you know where. I'd like. Ted Drew's famous frozen cuts. Yeah, that's what, you uh, should go get some of that. That's what Stoltz was referring it's gonna to. It's going to be nice out. Yeah. Stoltz should go get some of that famous frozen custard off of Chippewa. It really is good guys and gals. Um we like to confirm things in our great Mike Ryder, our boss. Yeah. Uh, he confirmed something research. for us. Yeah. Marshy wasn't there till 8.30. Yeah. Oh, really? Instead, Marshy was there till 7.30. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. The highlights were saved at exactly, the last one was saved at 7.31. The first one was saved at 6.15. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Now, I will say this. I want to add this. 
I do feel bad about that. <laughs> I actually feel bad about us huh. lead, like showing others their work prior to their show coming on the air, revealing the new sounders. That was bad form by us, and we apologize. So let's all, <laughs> let's all as a group, apologize to Marshy. One, two, three. Sorry, Sorry Marshy. Marshy. We feel bad about that. That is the one thing that yeah. I look back on. I'm like, okay, yeah, definitely shouldn't have done that. Fastlane should have been able to reveal the work yeah. that they put out there. Us playing the lineup game, zero regrets. Absolutely zero regrets from me about playing it yesterday at 11.15. Three hours prior to the start of their show when the lineup was put out there. You as a fan deserve to get the information yes. as quickly as humanly possible on this show. It's a news story, honestly, on opening day when the lineup is released. Don't, don't people hear our promos? We break news in St. Louis. <laughs> we are St. Louis, exactly. BK, and Ferrari. Also, according to our tech Text line 314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service text line. The fast lane has a history of shenanigans. Just ask the Rizzuto show. That is a totally fair point. They have stolen stuff from the Riz show as well. What I would say is this is actually a form of flattery for them. We are showing them that we respect and appreciate the work that they do on their show. True. They have great segments. And so, therefore, when necessary, we will do earlier in the day because we're on the air and they can't get to it. We will do one of their segments for them because of how much we appreciate it when they do it during their show. True. That's the truth. We appreciate what they do. And this is really just us saying that we respect their work. Yeah, and look, guys, I'm going to have a moment of honesty here. You know, when I was in Marsh's folder yesterday. <laughs> Is that a scary look, place to be? It was scary because I can't find anything in that folder because it's a mess. Okay. But you know what? I saw the lineup game 2024. That's what the folder was like. When I went, I'm not going to touch that. I'm going to go with all the old clips. You know, I didn't want to go into that folder. Yeah, but I, then what, see what's but, that door. Yeah, I didn't want to know. I didn't want to know. But then when I'm starting looking through this mess, I can't find some of the cuts that we needed for the older versions. Now, of the I will tell game. you this. I respect Marshy in this respect. I respect him in every respect, but especially here. Just I this. respect that he uh, put out a bluff and said he was here till 8.30. <laughs> That's true. If we had tried to do this from the morning show, there would be no ability to do so because nothing would have been saved. <laughs> they would have to redo it oh, yeah. every single day because Matt Rocchio has never saved anything in his entire life. Yeah, honestly, if Marshy wants to do this, he should just never save his audio drops like Rocchio because we never use anything from the either, opening drive. Either learn for him, from him or learn from the old producer of the fast lane, Brad Barnes, who hid the lineup game for me one day. That's true. And he put it in our system yeah. as not for Tanner, so when I would yeah. search the lineup game, I could not find it. And also, Kerry should love us because we stepped in when the fast lane was out for him and he had no voice. So we're yeah. here to help other people. Yeah, the, the best part about all of this is that I genuinely love and appreciate and respect all three of those, or all four of those guys. And Only three. Sorry, them, Marshy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we consider all of them to be friends. Apology wasn't but when real. it comes to radio, I'll be damned yeah. if we're getting called out for stealing segments when they stole our segment. The real important start is coming up next for Zach Thompson.
to more exclusive blues talk. 101 ESPN is live from the Centene Community Ice Center. Brought to you by Bud Light and E&B Granite. Bernie Federko's only choice for granite countertops, cabinets, and flooring. Zach Thompson. How big? A uh, big one. The St. Louis Cardinals need something out of Zach Thompson this season. And I think there's a decent chance he can earn this starting job beyond where we're at right now. <laughs> With this Dodgers lineup? Yeah. This is my throat. It really is messed up. <laughs> I think Steven Matz actually serves himself well by being a bullpen arm for this team. I, I don't think it would be a bad thing if for the rest of this season, when Sonny Gray gets back, the Cardinals make a decision. You know what? I know the money is supposed to play, but Steven, you're best out of the bullpen for us. You'll be our sixth starter. Whenever anybody gets hurt, you'll go back into the rotation. But for right now, we think we need you as a long man in our bullpen. Like yesterday would have been a great opportunity for them to just put Matt's in the game to finish things out after uh, Miles Michaelis ends up having to leave early. He probably wouldn't have been down five runs if you had Matt's available in the bullpen. I think Zach Thompson has real ability. Like I think he could be a long-term starter for this team beyond just the 2024 season. And if that is going to be the case, if he's going to be like a four starter for you moving forward, this is the kind of game where he's got to keep you competitive. I'm not telling you that he's got to go out there and give you seven innings of two run ball. That's not necessary. But can you do for the Cardinals today something similar to what you did last year against like, for example, the Milwaukee Brewers, five and a third, five hits, two earned runs, five strikeouts, one walk. Can you do that today against the the, the Dodgers? Can you give them a chance the biggest way that that'll happen, Alex, is by maintaining his velocity. This was the issue last year for Matthew Liberatore and not so much for Zach Thompson. In spring, his velocity was all over the place. At times, it would be up to like 95, and other times, it would be down to like 89. He's got to be able to maintain that because if he doesn't, this lineup will destroy him. But I'm super excited to see what Zach Thompson looks like against a primarily left-handed line. I've always liked the idea of Zach Thompson. I was rooting for him last year, and I felt like he had better stuff than Steven Matz. And I'm like, okay, well, let's keep him in this rotation. And, of course, he rode that train back and forth from Memphis. But, yeah, I mean, I'm with you. The problem is I don't think tonight or today – no, tonight. I don't think it matters for Zach Thompson because I just view the Cardinals as he can go out there and just deal. They're going to still move him back to the bullpen or put him back in Memphis when Steven Matz re or is ready to go and Sonny Gray is ready to go. I just, just like with Victor Scott, I know how the Cardinals operate. They're going to see signs of progress with Zach Thompson and say, man, you know what? It was great, but let's, let's go get him to hone in on some things. And frankly, I think that's why they disrupt the growth of some of these pitchers because when they see signs of growth and they're like, hey, you know what? He's starting to figure this out. Let's send him back to Memphis. Whereas if he's doing something right, even if it doesn't go his way, build off of that. Build off of that at the major leagues because the Dodgers are a really tough litmus test for Zach Thompson. Sure. Build off of it, though. But I know how this team operates. And uh, I'm getting pre-mad, BK, so sorry. But I know he's going to be back in Memphis, and they're going to be like, we want him to keep working on this, and we'll put Steven Matz here. And in two starts, Steven Matz is going to be on the injured list or in the bullpen. Yeah, I, I think if he pitches well, I, I think you're probably right that they send him down. This should be open Oof. to the idea of a six-man rotation. Oh, uh, that's And the reason I point. bring that up is I'm not saying you stick with it for the whole season. That typically doesn't work. But I remember last year, I don't remember which starter it was. I think it was when Manoa came back. The Blue Jays, they had five guys. Like, there was no need for them to say, hey, let's force Manoa into our rotation, who would have been awful last season. <laughs> Instead, they said, let's go with six. Somebody's going to struggle, and when that person struggles, if they have options, they either A, go down, or B, they go to the bullpen. And that's how they operated, and I think an injury occurred, and they ended up having – it worked out that way. You know, pitchers get hurt, especially starting pitching, to where they said, okay, now we've got our five-man rotation that's solidified. I would hope that that is more of the route that they explore. Now, granted, it would shorten your bullpen, but just pluck Matthew Liberator. You get rid of the long reliever, quote-unquote long reliever, and you say, let's go with the six-man rotation until somebody solidifies themselves but as... But now you're shorting the bullpen with a long reliever. Well, 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 take, but, but, take but here's what I would, here's what I would say. Here's innings. what I say. This rotation's built on throwing innings. But it's not. If you go to a six-man rotation, it, it ceases to exist and that way. Just now saw you've got Steven not. Matz and Zach Thompson, both of whom are not going to go super long into the game. So now you've actually added in another guy that's not going to go deeper while taking away a guy 
guy in your bullpen that can throw multiple innings, I actually think the worst thing that they can do is go to a six-man rotation. But why you, not pluck a guy out of the, ro- the, bu- the bullpen that's not going to benefit you and keep the extra long man? Why, like, why not get rid of Fernandez. Ryan Fernandez? Fernandez would be the one yeah. that probably ends up getting Why not get out. rid of him and keep the long man it, in the bullpen? Way, so yeah. The reason why I don't think this is necessary is because starting next week, you have one day off every single week up until May 2nd. So why, why are we going to a six-man rotation when you're playing six games a week for the next four weeks. I, I just I don't see that as something that this team needs to do, should do, will do. I think they go to a five man and then it just becomes a question of who is more worthy of that last spot in your rotation. Is it Zach Thompson? Is it Steven Matz? To me, the guy that is more worthy of that spot in the rotation, if he pitches better this weekend, would be Zach Thompson. Maybe. I, I, we'll see. If he pitches better, then yes, I think Matz has better stuff. And I know, like, everybody looks back on the time of Zach Thompson as a starter at the end of last season. I mean, he, opponents were hitting 272 against him. So it's not like opponents were hitting 230 and he was running into bad luck and putting up four spots. Like, yeah, he was fine. I don't – like, when Matz is right, Matz is definitely by far the better pitcher than Zach Thompson. I'm looking towards the future as well, though. And that's that's part of this conversation is, like – the Cardinals are straddling this line of playing for now, playing for the future at the same time. And for now, and for for now, I think they're close. For the future, I think one te- one is clearly better than the other, and that would be Zach Thompson for me. So that's that's why I'm placing so much weight for the starts this weekend. You've got Thompson tonight, Lynn tomorrow, Stephen Matz on Sunday. We'll see who is in the lineup going into this weekend. The Cardinals have said, "See Yanni, see Yanni." Cardinals have said that they want to get all of their bench guys at least an opportunity this weekend. Now that could come Smart. in the form of a start, could come in the form of. Uh, an opportunity coming off of the bench. I don't know how they're going to go Could about that. Some of those out yesterday. You but. know how they're going to go about this. <laughs> they're all starts, buddy. They're all starts. Coming up in about 15 minutes, we'll get to One's Gotta Go. 314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service X line. Four One's Gotta Go. You give us four different options. We will tell you which one's got to go at one third. But coming up next, we've got to get through a couple of things with some NFL quick hitters here on 101 ESPN.
wall blues coverage is right here. 101 ESPN is live from the Centene Community Ice Center. Brought to you by Bud Light and EB Granite. Bernie Federco's only choice for granite countertops, cabinets, and flooring. Alongside Alex and T-Bone, I'm BK. Let's dive into some NFL quick hitters here on BK and Ferrario. Alex, it was a big day yesterday for Pro Days. Two of mm-hmm. the top quarterbacks in this year's NFL draft were performing at their respective Pro Days, LSU and Washington. Let me guess, J.J. McCarthy, still the best available prospect out there. No, 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 no. He was not part of this yesterday. Michael Penix, your guy. You've always been a big Michael Penix Jr. Uh, fan. You said after their semifinal game, that's a locked-in first-round pick. I've seen first-round picks at quarterback before. That's what it looks like. And I said C.J. Stroud, and look at me. I'm good. One for one. So yesterday, <laughs> Michael Penix young. Jr. ran a 4-5-40. Hot damn. Which is remarkable. That's like that running is, back numbers. Yeah, that that's a really solid number for, like, a running back, a safety, a fast, a really fast linebacker would run in the 4-5s for context. Michael Penix Jr., not known for his athleticism. He's been typically a guy that kind of sits back there in the pocket and then delivers a rifle to his receivers. Alex, this is also a guy that has a cannon of an arm, put up big-time numbers in a Washington offense that, while it does have some trickery to it, is relatively pro-style. Like, so a lot of the stuff will translate to the NFL level. Do you think he has locked himself in as a legitimate first-round pick with the pre-draft process yeah. that we've seen from Michael I, I think that 4-5 is what did it because that was what everybody said. I remember us talking about it, and you said, yeah, but he's not as mobile. Yep. Uh, he showed his mobility. Now, does it look does it look good when you're in the middle of a game and you need to roll out of the, the pocket and create space? That I don't know. That you're not going to know until you see him in action. But to me, I think there are three guys that – I have the gut feel they're going to be good at the NFL level. And it's Caleb Williams, it's Jaden Daniels, and it's Michael Penix Jr. I don't believe in any of these other guys, the Bo Nix, the McCarthy. I just don't buy it. I don't think Penix is going to be at the same level as Jaden Daniels and at Caleb Williams. But I think there's going to be a team somewhere between 10 to 15 that if they take a chance on them, they're going to be very pleased in what they got. Like, to me, the Raiders scream Michael Penix Jr., Get this guy, even if he's not a starter for you this season, have him work to next year be the guy that you go to because I, I think he's got the right stuff. Yeah, I I don't know how to read into Michael Penix Jr. Like I, I would not burn a first round pick on him. And I love his I love the way he played in college, but you know, reading a college defense and being a gunslinger like he was is way harder at the NFL level because they do a much better job of disguising defenses, simulating pressure, and also the game is just not as spread open as it is at the college level. So uh, it's getting closer to that, but it's not that like it is in the college football landscape. So I don't know how I feel about Michael Penix Jr. I I don't think he has the same skill set as a Caleb Williams, a Drake May, a Jaden Daniels. And I don't know if I want to reach on him in the first round. If I'm a team and he kind of starts to drop and it looks like he's going to be a second rounder, okay, maybe I look to trade up in the second round and maybe then I go and pluck Michael Penix Jr. I just don't think I would – I don't think I would take him in the first round. I just don't know – I don't have a good feel for who he is and what, what kind of comp he is for the NFL level. One team that I find really interesting in this regard, if you're Dallas. Mm, That's a really good one. And he's at 24. And you've decided, and this would have to be your decision, and it would create a whole hell of a lot of headlines, to say the least. Yeah, we're going to move on from Dak after this season. We don't want to give him the $60 million per year contract, the $55 million per year contract that he's going to be looking for. Because he's going into his final year of his deal, and next year a franchise tag is basically something that is impossible for Dallas to do with him. They would have to sign him long-term after the season, and they've said they're not doing that prior to. If he's there at 24, do you consider it? I would, especially because if I'm Dallas, like, I don't know if I have a lot of, I mean, the running back is a problem for you this season, but I don't know if I have a lot of holes that I look at and I say, where are we weakest at that we need to fill with the first round pick? I think your biggest hole is getting an actual capable quarterback that could get it done in the playoffs, and if he's not there next year, yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, if Dak is gone, which I'm not paying that guy $60 million if I can't get you to give me playoff wins, yeah, I would probably take that quarterback if he's still sitting there. 
I don't think I would do it. I I don't a I don't want to spend a first rounder on him when I can spend a first rounder that can help my roster and quarterbacks not a need in there. It's more of a want and I understand what you're saying about you're looking at next year because these situations don't go over well. When you draft a quarterback in the first round, well, you've got a guy. Well, that, when has that gone poorly? Well, like, I don't know. Like, well, Green Bay it led to Rodgers wanting out. Looks um, like it worked well for them. Uh, we'll see. What, what just happened this past jury, year? Jury is still out on that. I don't think uh, it is. Better than Aaron Rodgers. I, I think it leads to much more controversy than anything else. And I, I just think they can help themselves better. And look, I understand what you're saying. And I can't even say you're wrong because he hasn't played well in the playoffs. Dak plays well in the regular season. I think at some point that's going to translate to the playoffs. I think Dak is the long-term answer there, and he's not old enough for me to be saying they've got to draft a quarterback. I saw Mike T Tannenbaum on ESPN today said the L.A. Rams should be targeted in Michael Penix. I went, what So the that's hell? the other one that I was wondering about. Because no. I, I don't know how much longer Stafford's going to be playing. They've got the 19th overall pick. You'd probably want to trade down a bit if you're going to do something like this. The Rams <laughs> always could utilize some more picks. If I'm um, the Rams, though, I would be thinking, like, see if you get Bo Nix in the second round rather than use a first-round pick for that. Totally fair. But that, that would be one team that I'd look at. And then another one, if we're just going to throw out um, potential, like, surprise teams that could take him in the, in the late first, maybe Miami. They've got the, the Tua situation that they've got to deal with as well. I don't think that they're going to bail from that, but that would be one other scenario that, that could be of interest. And then if none of those teams do it, the other thing to keep in mind is, hey, if New England moves down in the first round, they decide not to take a quarterback at number three and they let Minnesota or something like that come up, well, they could either utilize the picks that they get from that team that they trade down from to get Michael Penix Jr. or they could then move up from 34 where they're currently selecting to go get Michael Penix Jr., Bo Nix, one of those guys that could go in late first. Uh, they could do it that way as well, which, I mean, man, can you imagine if they decided we're going to trade down, we're going to get to, let's say it ends up being like the Giants that decide to trade up. They're going from six to three. They want to get one of the quarterbacks. And then New England gets... Malik Neighbors at number six overall, the wide receiver out of LSU. And then in the late first, they're able to jump up and get Michael Penix Jr. That'd be a hell of a haul if you're the New England Patriots. And you could make an argument that it's better than taking like Jaden Daniels at number three overall. So yeah. there's so many quarterbacks that are of interest in this year's draft that I think it makes it one of the more compelling nights of the first round in recent years. The other quarterback that was on display yesterday at his pro day was Jaden Daniels. He didn't do anything that I think changed really much about his draft conversation, but his coach, Brian Kelly, Jaden Daniels, the LSU quarterback oh, previously. No. What'd you do, Brian? <laughs> his coach, Brian Kelly, came out afterwards and was like, yeah, I know there's a lot of questions about his size, but there's other guys in the NFL. Look at Lamar Jackson who have succeeded despite that. He's got a similar size, similar frame to what Lamar has for the Baltimore Ravens. He certainly has been okay winning multiple MVPs did, in the NFL. Did Kelly say it with his Louisiana accent? He then continued... <laughs> I think he's going to have a lot of success for Washington. Oh, God, Brian. Washington, of course, has the number two overall pick. There's been a lot of conversation about Jaden Daniels being their intended target at number two overall. Guys, do you think he spilled the beans on accident here? Yeah, I think he exactly spilled the beans on accident. Now, obviously, Washington can decide what they want to do, if they want to take him or if somebody jumps in front of him. But, yeah, I, I mean – Keep your mouth shut, Ryan. Like, dude, you in this Louisiana accent and acting like you're the big shot around the... Like, just shut the hell up, man. <laughs> if I'm Jaden Daniels, be like, Coach, what are you doing? What are you doing to me, man? No, I don't mind. I, like that, I don't mind. I, I think he totally spoiled. I think Jaden Daniels knows he's going to Washington. Like, he's probably apartment shopping right now. Like, <laughs> apartment I, shopping? He's buying a house. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I would be apartment shopping if I were going to you know, Washington. He's, you know that He's bonus. looking for a nice house. I, I think he totally... AK spoiled. I think Ron Rivera spoiled it earlier. I remember a month ago, Ron Rivera, who had been fired, said on NFL Live, yeah, the, the, we really wanted Jaden Daniels at the number two pick. Well, um, you just left the organization. I'm assuming that hey, philosophy is still the same. If I'm Washington. him, I'm going to spill all the beans. Yeah. All right, final thing before we get out of here and get to one's got to go. 314-399-9646 is the air cover service text line. You give us four options. We will tell you which one's got to go on the other side. The Kansas City Chiefs agreed to terms with a European rugby star. I'm going to call him L. L R Z because I don't know how to pronounce his name, frankly. Um, Reese Zamet. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Louis Reese. Louis Reese Zamet. There you go. Um, of course. He's 23 he's years old. He ran a 4-4 in the 40-yard dash. Do you guys have interest in this? Do you think that he's going to be somebody that could be of use with the new uh, kick return 
rules. I mean, they're going to try him at running back, I'm, and then he apparently is somebody that they want to see. I mean, look, if he's a rugby returns. player, it's going to be tough to take him down. I'll give him that. So I don't know if it's going to be that. I could see him using this dude as like a red zone running back when nobody's expecting him to, to run on the field. Stop. Yeah. Stop. This is not going to work. Look, you, you've seen stop. rugby players play, right? Yeah, and they're good at rugby, not football. They're good at not getting taken down by other this strong guy is dudes. super fast. Like, if you look at his highlights, he is noticeably faster than everybody else on the, the rugby pitch. I think it's what they call it in rugby. No idea. I hope. I don't. I don't watch that much rugby, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, just I just know, know that these guys are. I tough. just know a lot of guys have come over from rugby, and like I've never seen one that I'm like, wow, that was awesome. This guy came over. BK, like I well, saw. You've never seen Louis BK, Sam. BK, BK, it seems like he loves the signing. Like the Chiefs just got to steal the off season. They still need a wide they receiver, did. BK. Yeah. That's fine. They're gonna sign Odell Beckham. Coming up next, uh, one's gotta go here on 101 ESPN. <laughs>
101 ESPN Sports Center. I'm Jordan Deacon. The Sports Center update is driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. It's a busy time for St. Louis sports. Yesterday was opening day, and the Cardinals did not have a great start as they lost 7 to 1 to the Los Angeles Dodgers. They take on LA again tonight, and it's a late one with first pitch at 9:10. And Zach Thompson will be taking the mound for the Cards. Last night, the Blues beat the Flames by a score of 5 to 3. Goaltender Jordan Bennington had two assists, and Nathan Walker showed up big in another fight. The Blues are playing San Jose tomorrow at 7. And we'll have pregame for you starting at 6. And St. Louis City SC is also back in action tomorrow night against Real Salt Lake with kickoff at 8.30. On top of all of that, all weekend long, we've got March Madness coverage for you right here on 101 ESPN beginning tonight starting at 6 right after the fast lane. I'm Jordan Deacon. The Sports Center update was driven by Johnny Londoff. Find new roads and stop 24-7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? More Blues Talk, more often. 101 ESPN is live from the Centene Community Ice Center. Brought to you by Bud Light and ENB Granite. Bernie Federko's only choice for granite countertops, cabinets, and flooring. This is BK and Ferrario. Time now for One's Gotta Go. We offer up the talking points, and you get to pick which one's gotta go on 101 ESPN. Count that, that big pen. All right, let's play a game of one's got to go. You give us four options. We'll tell you which one's got to go. 314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service text line. That is where you can send these in. Let's start out with this one. One's got to go. Tanner's least favorite things edition. Oh, boy. Oh, Seltzers. Big list. Protein powder. What? Tender. <laughs> Or vegan hot dogs. Which one's got to go? protein powder. Seltzers, protein powder, <laughs> tender, or vegan hot dogs. Uh, T-Bone, which one's got to go? We'll start with you for so this one. So, tender stays. Um, <laughs> of course it does. Uh, why not? Because you use it all the time. The protein powder definitely stays. Why, I don't really know. But uh, <laughs> I don't remember what the other one was. Vegan hot, vegan hot dogs or seltzers? Sel- I mean, seltzers are gross, but, like, if I need a nice, if I need a buzz and it's the only thing there, I'll, ta- I'll drink them. But... Vegan hot dogs? Oh, disgusting. Get rid of the vegan dogs. Those things do not belong uh, in this conversation. Protein powder. It makes me go boom, boom. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. So <laughs> stay away from it. Tried it when I was in high school. Didn't work. Yeah, mine's got to be tender. Uh, Alex, I'm a happily married man. I, I understand that maybe, <laughs> you know that's a gr- maybe you've got some Damn questions it. you'd like to Damn answer it, when you get home. That's a great point. <laughs> oh, I'm going to go with the obvious here and say, I'm going to go ahead and set aside the tender. I'm good for now. Look, man, I got a third kid coming. Even if I was on tender, it wasn't going to work for me. All right. One's got to go Easter uh, treats edition. Peeps, jelly beans, the Robin Eggs or Reese's Peanut Butter oh, Eggs? Oh, it's the Robin Eggs by far, 100%. Nobody needs that much chocolate. No, Mine is disagree. the very clearly the Peeps. Oh, peeps are it. disgusting, I dude. love marshmallows. Really? Love marshmallows. Peeps are gross. No. And I don't understand the appeal of them. My, it has never made any sense to my me. My father-in-law buys those large chocolate bunnies for us every year. And, like, Katie and I tell him all the time, why do you keep buying this? Yeah. We don't eat it. It sits in our pantry for, like, six months, and then we throw it away. Why are you such Absolutely. a hater of the chocolate just, bunny? It's just so much chocolate. I, I tend to agree with BK. I don't like the Peeps. <laughs> But I jelly beans are worse. I hate what? jelly beans. Oh, they oh, make dude. my stomach the hurt. The Starburst oh, jelly disgusting. beans are the Ugh. bomb. I, I Get those totally out of here. agree with Alex on this one. One's got to go Kids Movies Edition, Frozen, Cars, Shrek, or Despicable Me. I'll start with this one, guys. I've never understood the appeal of Despicable Me. I find it to be super. Really? <laughs> yeah, the well, minions? I, I find them yeah, to be I so annoying. It, maybe that's where me and Tanner just disagree on everything fundamentally is like is our, the minions our view of the minions. minions. <laughs> that's that's really the everything else is a symptom of see, that root problem. See, I'm the difference. There. Mine's Cars. I never really? liked. Really? I never liked the I film. Like cars. I did. I never got into the characters. I just. I didn't like it as much as I liked the others. I was a huge Shrek fan growing up. Loved it. Yeah, I would have to get rid of Frozen here. For what? Oh, wow. The okay. Prin- well, that's the, the princesses thing. Just not up my alley. The cars. I. I Doesn't enjoy, even matter. I used to have a. I used to have a thing on the PS2, an old Cars video game that I loved to play. Dude, it's not up. even uh, about the princess thing. The songs Shrek are and, awesome. Uh, no, I, I think they're annoying. Get Frozen out of here. You can get a Shrek donkey. Like, no, you just can't. So the and other the three got to stay. I'm, I'm making waffles. Uh, 304-399-9646 is the air comfort service text line for one's got to go. 
One's got to go St. Louis Staples, the zoo, the Don't magic say house, the, arch. the city museum, or the science center. Ooh, Zoo, okay, this is Magic good. House, City Museum, or Science Center. And these are all really good options. Uh, so let's start with that. Like these, I would not want to get rid of any of yeah. the four. Uh, the, I'll get rid of the Magic House because I, I've I had an incident there. <laughs> but I also, I feel like in terms of spending time there with my kids, I feel like all three of the other ones, they'd get more of a kick out of. Now, City Museum sounds like an awful idea for my three-year-old and two-year-old. Uh, but as they get older, I feel like that's going to be a spot that they're going to hang out at a lot. I love the Science Center, and of course, the zoo is the goat of it all. I would say the reason why I'm also going with the Magic House here is because the zoo, City Museum, and Science Center have events for the olds like us and for the kids, whereas the, the Magic House is like legitimately just centering itself towards children. There's nothing wrong with that. It has a purpose, and it fills it well. But the other ones, like, there are events at the zoo, the city museum, and the science center that are actually, like, specifically geared towards the adults. So, uh, for me, as a 31-year-old washed-up man with the child at True. home, those are the three that I would uh, prefer. Do they still have the uh, the earthquake simulator at the science center? I used to love that thing when I was a kid. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't been to the science center. I don't know how long. I oh. go there. I go by it a lot, but I have not been I went, like, while. six months ago. I took my daughter because she's starting to like yeah. dinosaurs. And, of course, the big T-Rex there, she got a kick out of that. They do the science on tap over there. So, or, excuse me, the... the <laughs> Alcohol's yes, involved, so exactly. somebody's going to be there. Unbelievable. They, they do the uh, the taste of St. Louis over there as well. We do the beer and the food events that they have there. But yeah. the vegan, I, foods. Uh, vegan I, foods. I'm going to say I love all four of these. The That's one that so, I would yeah. get rid of would be Zoo because, it, you know, if it's like a summertime event that I'm doing this, the Zoo's not the spot to go to. Really? Yeah, and, and look, maybe maybe, I, maybe just because I haven't heard a lion roar, but that's, that's why yeah. I have not in person. the Zoo. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It'll change your life. <laughs> yeah. uh, spring Sports Edition. Masters, March Madness, Super Bowl, or World Series? I guess this is just actually the like Super Bowl in the spring. Contending edition. <laughs> uh, Masters, March Madness, Super Bowl, or this, World Series? Which one's got to go? This is easy. This is so easy. It is the Masters. Oh no way! I couldn't think of something more boring than watching a guy hit a white ball. Dude, I love the Masters. A golf like, ball. I should clarify. I, baseball moves a lot better. I, I make it a like a, a weekend thing for the Masters, especially on Sunday. I love it so much. Mine actually would be March Madness. If really? those are the four you're putting in front of me, I would take the March Madness one out of it. Because after the first round, I'm not as invested, unless there's a team to be invested in, as I am with everything else. I'm with T-Bone just because these other three things I'm super interested in. And the Masters, like, it is on my bucket list of events to go to. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, like, very high on the list. But, but you guys aren't into, go go into golf. So, like, I think that's part of the reason why. I like why. watching golf live. I like live. to play. Uh, I, I yeah. just have no way. Like, I, I love playing tennis. I cannot watch tennis. Like, I just don't do it. That's interesting. Yeah, because, see, I, I just, I used to hate the Masters because, like, my dad would watch it. I'd be like, this is boring as hell. But now that I'm playing it, I love just sitting back, especially on Sunday when it's that final round. Agreed. There is nothing more exciting than watching that. One of me. my favorite events I've ever been to was the PGA Championship. Oh, yeah. Here and following, following Tiger, Tiger Woods, it was, yep. it's one of my favorite memories that I'll have in sports, and I'm not sure very many things will ever be able to top that. With you coming up next, we'll hit the BK and Ferrario rewind with our reaction to opening day for the St. Louis Cardinals. We'll do that next. You're on 101 ESPN.
to more exclusive blues talk. 101 ESPN is live from the Centene Community Ice Center. Brought to you by Bud Light and E&B Granite. Bernie Federko's only choice for granite countertops, cabinets, and flooring. Let's run it back with a daily rewind on BK and Ferrario. Brought to you by Gloria Lou, your home sold guaranteed realty. Selling your home begins at GloriaHasTheBuyers.com. is broadcasting live from Budweiser Brewhouse inside Ballpark Village next Thursday for the home opener. It's almost here. We're going to be set up just steps away from Bush Stadium. The opening drive will be there. The fast lane will be there. And yes, we will be there as well. Coming to you live next Thursday from 7 a.m. until 6 p.m. right here on 101 ESPN. The opening day broadcast is brought to you by Holiday World Splash and Safari and by Budweiser. Been a good show today. Had a lot of fun with it. For Alex and T-Bone, I'm BK. We're broadcasting live today at the e Granite Studios out at the Centene Community Ice Center. Jordan Deacon has done a fantastic job for us broadcasting uh, back at the studios for us today. Guys, we'll finish where we started, which is the reaction to the opening day loss for the St. Louis Cardinals. I think the biggest frustration for me and for most fans is that it looked so similar to what it did a year ago. The offense gets stalemated by a solid starter your starting pitcher gets hit around by in uh exceptional offense in la and it just there was nothing that appeared to have changed paul goldschmidt gets three hits the rest of your lineup finishes with zero combined uh, that that's i think where the frustration comes in is okay so i i've seen this story before it was the entirety of the 2023 season and it was supposed to be different but it's the same actors in the same movie with the same ending, Alex. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you there. I, the offense was frustrating, and I know I can't overreact, but look, like when you're going up against Tyler Glass now, you, you got if your offense is supposed to be as good as your offense is made to be, it's going to have to at least look competitive against the other team's best pitchers, and you didn't. But my more frustration came from the pitching side of it because it's what I was screaming about all off season. It was what I was screaming about throughout the spring training and the Cardinals kept trying to push the, well, we want quality innings. We want quality starts and we need innings from our guys. The problem is you can say that all you want, but when you're down five, nothing by the third inning, it doesn't matter if you're getting five or six innings from your pitcher, which by the way, you didn't yesterday. It doesn't matter your offense. It's going to have to be, unbelievably good for you to even think about being a playoff team. You didn't want to spend the money on going to get a quality pitcher in the offseason and instead you're going to try and sell us on Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson. That being your second best pitcher is problematic for me now with what the rest looks like. Yeah, I think the... I, I'm not as upset about the offense. I, I think great offenses will get shut down by a, an ace that has his A game and that's what Glasnow had yesterday. Um, the pitching is the one that was alarming and I, I think you saw why you don't want Michaelis as your two yesterday. E even though I know it's only one start, he's going up against one of the best teams that you're going to have to be both in the regular season and in the playoffs. And the Dodgers just knocked him around. And you, like you said, they, they were done by the third inning. You know, when you're down five, nothing, I don't care how good your offense is. If you got that big of a mountain to climb through three innings, a third of the game, it's going to be a tough task. And that was something that they struggled with yesterday. I do think something that's going to be interesting to monitor as this season goes along is how will Ollie handle these pitchers if they have outings like that. So that was one of the questions that I I was going to ask for you guys. I mentioned this yesterday in our text thread. T-Bone, you pushed back a little bit, and it was fair, saying, hey, the, the pitch count early in a season, they don't like these guys going that that deep into games in terms of pitch count, not, not innings. Miles Michaelis was at 74 pitches yesterday when he was removed from the game with four and a third innings. I believe at that point they had gotten to the top of the lineup again, and it yeah, was they Mookie were Betts. Tani, I think, because someone was on from the top of the order. Okay, because it was a, it was a lefty that came up to the plate. I know that much yeah. because that's why they brought in um, Andre Pallante. I, I did find it interesting that they decided to take him out there. Did you guys have a problem with it at all? Did you question it at all? Because the whole value of Miles Michaelis' innings 
And yesterday he didn't provide that for you, and he did only throw 74 pitches. For, for, the, for the way, sorry, T-Bone, for the way that Ollie handled that pull in the runners when it came to that first runner of the game with Mookie Betts, to me, I didn't have a problem with it. I think he matched his pitch count, but I also felt like they knew that that game was going to be out of reach, and they were like, let's not wear and tear Miles Michaelis down in this game. I, I think it was just a pitch count thing. And I, I, that's all I think it was, and I think that's probably why they pulled him. I didn't have an issue with it. I mean, he wasn't performing well either, so why not start going to your bullpen early on? Where I think it gets interesting is when we're two weeks from now and if Michaelis has another outing like that what do they do because I, I think it is very risky and I understand the purpose of this rotation is oh we got to have them eat six innings in game one of a series I think it's a little risky to be saying all right well let's see if we can continue to go out there and throw up zeros when it's clear he was really struggling to do that especially against the top of the order I, I don't know I, I find it fascinating because you're right I mean if he was up to a, if he's built up 100% and is at like 100 pitches to where he could throw I, I, the whole purpose of this rotation means Michael should have been out there still. So that that's where I'm going to get very In two intrigued. weeks, if you have the exact same start, he should be out there for the yeah. fifth inning and finish it, and then he should probably come back out for the sixth as well. Yeah. In that exact same scenario, if you're down 5 nothing at that point in the game, I know you want to give yourself a chance to be able to win, but if you signed these pitchers for the reasons that they have described, you need to have him out there for probably close to 100 pitches. Last year, uh, if you're looking at Lance Lynn, for example, in 32 starts, he went at least 95 pitches in 24 of them. So you got to let him go out there and work. His whole value is getting the work. And sometimes that means he's going five and a third for you, but you got to get him up into that 95 plus pitch range because that's what he's there to do. That is the entire value of somebody like that. If you're looking at it for a guy like Kyle Gibson, he went 95 plus pitches in about half of his starts a year ago. His is more about efficiency, getting quick outs, getting those ground balls, getting in and out of innings. That's how he gets to the innings. So uh, between Michaelis and Lance Land, those dudes just need to be out there they need to throw pitches and I, I will be interested to see what it looks like in the future if they have a similar start to a game that they saw yesterday Cardinals back in action tonight Blues back in action tomorrow we'll break it all down for you on Monday by the way Battle Hawks in action this weekend Go -go! City SC in action this weekend as well NCAA tournament continues this weekend I Man, a lot of Blues sports in going action. on so much I already mentioned them no, to be didn't. able to watch to be able to break down on Monday we're looking forward to doing all of that with you on Monday morning at 11 a.m. if you missed anything from today's show be sure to check out out of the podcast page. It's all brought to you by Dobbs Tire and Auto Center. For Jordan Deacon, who did a fantastic job filling in in the studio for us today, and Tanner Hendrickson, Alex Ferrario, I'm Brandon Kylie. The Fast Lane's coming up next year on 101 ESPN.